Dramatis Personae of Richard the Third. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Richard the Third by William Shakespeare. Dramatis Personae. King Edward the Fourth, read by David Cole. Edward, Prince of Wales, read by Sandra. Richard, Duke of York, read by Tricia G. George, Duke of Clarence, read by Bob Sherman. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, read by David Nicholl. Son of Clarence, read by Nazini Cartbray. Henry, Earl of Richmond, played by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Cardinal Bourchier, read by Nolifidian. Archbishop of York, read by Abbaye. Bishop of Eli, voiced by Robert Smith. The Duke of Buckingham, read by M. B. The Duke of Norfolk, read by Bruce Peary. Earl of Surrey, read by Lucy Perry. Earl Rivers, read by Denny Sayers. Marquis of Dorset, read by Stephen Carney. Lord Grey, read by O. One, two, three. Oxford, read by Roger Clifton. Lord Hastings, read by Peter Bloomfield. Lord Stanley, Read by Andy Minter. Lord Lovell. Read by L. Lambert Lawson. Sir Thomas Vaughan. Read by David Lawrence. Sir Richard Ratcliffe. Read by Filippo Joaquin. Sir William Catesby. Read by Sahar Eisenstein Bond. Sir James Tyrrell. Read by Wanivu Mofo. Sir James Blunt. Read by Nolifidian. Sir Walter Herbert. Read by L. Lambert Lawson. Sir Robert Brackenberry. Read by Garrett Fitzgerald. Christopher Erswick. Read by Christopher Caron. Priest. Read by David Lawrence. The Lord Mayor of London. Played by Mark Smith. Sheriff of Wiltshire. Voiced by Robert Smith. Queen Elizabeth. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Queen Margaret. Read by Ruth Golding. The Duchess of York. Read by Karen Savage. Lady Anne. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Daughter of Clarence. Read by Avaye. First Gentleman. Read by David Lawrence. Pursuivant. Read by Matt Judd. A Scrivener. Read by Elizabeth Clett. First Citizen. Read by Zonia. Second Citizen. Read by Stephen Carney. Third Citizen. Read by Wani Humofo. First Murderer, voiced by Robert Smith. Second Murderer, read by Zonia. Messenger, read by Kalinda. Second Messenger, read by Veronica Jenkins. Third Messenger, read by Zonia. Fourth Messenger, read by Roger Clifton. Ghost of Prince Edward, read by Snaefaxi. Ghost of Henry the Sixth, read by Wani Mofo. Narrated by Diana Mylingar. End of Dramatis Personae. Act One of Richard the Third by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act One, Scene One, London, a street. Enter Gloucester. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this sun of York, and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, 
nor maid to court an amorous looking-glass. I, that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph, I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them, why I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to by my shadow in the sun, and discant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these farewell-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain, and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate, the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs the murderer shall be. <gasps> Dive thoughts down to my soul, here Clarence comes. Enter Clarence, guarded, and Brackenbury. Brother, good day. What means this armed guard that waits upon your grace? His majesty, tendering my person's safety, hath appointed this conduct to convey me to the tower. Upon what cause? Because my name is George. Alack, my lord, that fault is none of yours. He should for that commit your godfathers. Oh, belike his majesty hath some intent that you should be new christened in the tower. But what's the matter, Clarence? May I know? Yea, Richard, when I know, for I protest as yet I do not. But as I can learn, he hearkens after prophecies and dreams, and from the cross-row plucks the letter G, and says a wizard told him that by G his issue disinherited should be. And for my name of George begins with G, it follows in his thought that I am he. These, as I learn, and such like toys as these, hath moved his highness to commit me now. Why, this it is when men are ruled by women. Tis not the king that sends you to the tower. My lady Grey, his wife, Clarence, tis she that tempers him to this extremity. Was it not she and that good man of worship, Antony Woodville, her brother there, that made him send Lord Hastings to the tower, from whence this present day he is delivered? We are not safe, Clarence. We are not safe. By heaven, I think there is no man is secure but the queen's kindred, and night-walking heralds that trudge betwixt the king and mistress shore. Heard you not what an humble suppliant Lord Hastings was to her for his delivery? Humbly complaining to her deity, got my Lord Chamberlain his liberty. I'll tell you what. I think it is our way, if we will keep in favour with the king, to be her men and wear her livery. The jealous o'erworn widow and herself, since that our brother dubbed them gentlewomen, are mighty gossips in our monarchy. I beseech your graces both to pardon me. His Majesty has straightly given in charge that no man shall have private conference of what degree soever with your brother. Even so, and please your worship, Rackenbrae, you may partake of anything we say. We speak no treason, man. We say, the king is wise and virtuous, and his noble queen well struck in years fair and not jealous. We say that Shaw's wife hath a pretty foot, a cherry lip, a bonny eye, a passing pleasing tongue, and that the queen's kindred are made gentlefolks. How say you, sir? Can you deny all this? With this, my lord, myself have naught to do. Naught to do with Mistress Shaw? I tell thee, fellow, he that doth naught with her, excepting one, were best to do it secretly alone. What one, my lord? Her husband, knave! Wouldst thou betray me? I do beseech your grace to pardon me, and withal, 
forbear your conference with the noble duke we know thy charge brackenbury and will obey we are the queen's abjects and must obey brother farewell i will unto the king and whatsoe'er you will employ me in were it to call king edward's widow sister i will perform it to enfranchise you meantime this deep disgrace in brotherhood touches me deeper than you can imagine i know it pleaseth neither of us well well your imprisonment shall not be long i will deliver or else lie for you meantime have patience i must perforce farewell exeunt clarence brackenbury and guard go tread the path that thou shalt ne'er return simple plain clarence i do love thee so that i will shortly send thy soul to heaven if heaven will take the present at our hands but who comes here the new delivered hastings enter hastings a good time of day unto my gracious lord as much unto my good lord chamberlain well are you welcome to the open air how hath your lordship brooked imprisonment with patience noble lord as prisoners must but i shall live my lord to give them thanks that were the cause of my imprisonment no doubt no doubt and so shall clarence too for they that were your enemies are his and have prevailed as much on him as you more pity that the eagles should be mewed whilst kites and buzzards prey at liberty what news abroad no news so bad abroad as this at home the king is sickly weak and melancholy and his physicians fear him mightily now by saint paul that news is bad indeed oh he hath kept an evil diet long and overmuch consumed his royal person tis very grievous to be thought upon what is he in his bed he is go you before and i will follow you exit hastings he cannot live i hope and must not die till george be packed with post-horse up to heaven i'll in to urge his hatred more to clarence with lies well steeled with weighty arguments and if i fail not in my deep intent clarence have not another day to live which done god take king edward to his mercy and leave the world for me to bustle in for then i'll marry warwick's youngest daughter what though i killed her husband and her father the readiest way to make the wench amends is to become her husband and her father the which will i not all so much for love as for another secret close intent by marrying her which i must reach unto <laughs> but yet i run before my horse to market clarence still breathes edward still lives and reigns when they are gone then must i count my gains exit scene two london another street enter the corpse of king henry the sixth born in an open coffin gentlemen bearing halberds to guard it and lady anne as mourner set down set down your honourable load if honour may be shrouded in a hearse whilst i awhile obsequiously lament the untimely fall of virtuous lancaster poor key-cold figure of a holy king pale ashes of the house of lancaster thou bloodless remnant of that royal blood be it lawful that i invocate thy ghost to hear the lamentations of poor anne wife to thy edward to thy slaughtered son stabbed by the self-same hand that made these wounds lo in these windows that let forth thy life i pour the helpless balm of my poor eyes o oh, cursed be the hand that made these holes cursed the heart that had the heart to do it cursed the blood that let this blood from hence more direful hap betide that hated wretch that makes us wretched by the death of thee than i can wish to adders spiders toads or any creeping venom thing that lives if ever he have child abortive be it prodigious and untimely brought to light whose ugly and unnatural aspect may fright the hopeful mother at the view and that be heir to his unhappiness if ever he have wife let her be made more miserable by the death of him than i am made by my young lord and thee come now 
towards Chertsey with your holy load, taken from Paul's to be interred there, and still as you are weary of this weight, rest you, whilst I lament King Henry's course. The bearers take up the corpse and advance. Enter Gloucester. Stay, you that bear the corpse, and set it down. What black magician conjures up this fiend to stop devoted charitable deeds? Villains, set down the corpse, or by St. Paul I'll make a corpse of him that disobeys. My lord, stand back and let the coffin pass. Unmannered dog! Stand thou when I command! Advance thy halberd higher than my breast, or by St. Paul I'll strike thee to my foot and spurn upon thee, beggar for thy boldness. The bearer set down the coffin. What do you tremble? Are you all afraid? Alas, I blame you not, for you are mortal, and mortal eyes cannot endure the devil. Avaunt, thou dreadful minister of hell! Thou hadst but power over his mortal body. His soul thou canst not have, therefore be gone. Sweet saint, for charity be not so cursed. Foul devil! For God's sake, hence and trouble us not, for thou hast made the happy earth thy hell, filled it with cursing cries and deep exclaims. If thou delight to view thy heinous deeds, behold this pattern of thy butcheries. O oh, gentlemen, see, see dead Henry's wounds open their congealed mouths and bleed afresh. Blush. Blush, thou lump of foul deformity, for tis thy presence that exhales this blood from cold and empty veins where no blood dwells. Thy deeds, inhuman and unnatural, provokes this deluge most unnatural. O oh God, which this blood mates, revenge his death! O oh earth, which this blood drinks, revenge his death! Either heaven with lightning strike the murderer dead, or earth gape open wide and eat him quick, as thou dost swallow up this good king's blood which his hell-governed arm hath butchered. Lady, you know no rules of charity, which renders good for bad, blessings for curses. Villain, thou know'st no law of God nor man, no beast so fierce but knows some touch of pity. But I know none and therefore am no beast. Oh, wonderful, when devils tell the truth. More wonderful when angels are so angry. Vouchsafe, divine perfection of a woman, of these supposed crimes to give me leave by circumstance but to acquit myself. Vouchsafe, diffused infection of a man, of these known evils but to give me leave by circumstance to accuse thy cursed self. Fairer than tongue can name thee, let me have some patient leisure to excuse myself. Fouler than heart can think thee, thou canst make no excuse current but to hang thyself. By such despair I should accuse myself. And by despairing shalt thou stand excused, for doing worthy vengeance on thyself that didst unworthy slaughter upon others. Say that I slew them not. Then say they were not slain, but dead they are, and devilish slave by thee. I did not kill your husband. Why, then he is alive. Nay, he is dead, and slain by Edward's hand. In thy foul throat thou liest. Queen Margaret saw thy murderous falchion smoking in his blood, the which thou once didst bend against her breast, but that thy brothers beat aside the point. I was provoked by her slanderous tongue that laid their guilt upon my guiltless shoulders. Thou wast provoked by thy bloody mind, that never dreamt on aught but butcheries. Didst thou not kill this king? <sighs> I grant ye. Dost grant me, hedgehog? Then God grant me too thou mayst be damned for that wicked deed. Oh, he was gentle, mild, and virtuous. The better for the king of heaven that hath him. He is in heaven where thou shalt never come. Let him thank me that hope to send him thither, for... He was fitter for that place than earth. And thou unfit for any place but hell. Yes, one place else, if you will hear me name it. Some dungeon. Your bedchamber? Ill rest betide the chamber where thou liest. So will it, madam, till I lie with you. I hope so. I know so. But 
gentle Lady Anne, to leave this keen encounter of our wits and fall something into a slower method, is not the causa of the timeless deaths of these Plantagenets, Henry and Edward, as blameful as the executioner? Thou wast the cause and most accursed effect. Your beauty was the cause of that effect. Your beauty that did haunt me in my sleep to undertake the death of all the world so I might live one hour in your sweet bosom. If I thought that, I tell thee, homicide, these nails should rend that beauty from my cheeks. These eyes could not endure that beauty's wreck. You should not blemish if I stood by, as all the world is cheered by the sun, so I by that. It is my day my life black night or shade thy day and death thy life curse not thyself fair creature thou art both i would i were to be revenged on thee it is a quarrel most unnatural to be revenged on him that loveth thee it is a quarrel just and reasonable to be revenged on him that kills my husband he that bereft thee lady of thy husband did it to help thee to a better husband his better doth not breathe upon the earth. He lives that loves thee better than he could. Name him. Plantagenet. Why, that was he. The selfsame name, but one of better nature. Where is he? Here. <laughs> Why dost thou spit at me? Would it were mortal poison for thy sake. Never came poison from so sweet a place. Never hung poison on a fouler toad. Out of my sight thou dost infect mine eyes. Thine eyes, sweet lady, have infected mine. Would they were basilisks to strike thee dead. I would they were, that I might die at once, for now they kill me with a living death. Those eyes of thine from mine have drawn salt tears, shamed their aspects with store of childish drops. These eyes which never shed remorseful tear. No, when my father York and Edward wept to hear the piteous moan that Rutland made when black-faced Clifford shook his sword at him, nor when thy warlike father, like a child, told the sad story of my father's death, and twenty times made pause to sob and weep that all the standers-by had wet their cheeks like trees bedashed with rain. In that sad time my manly eyes did scorn an humble tear. And what these sorrows could not thence exhale, thy beauty have, and made them blind with weeping. I never sued to friend nor enemy, my tongue could never learn sweet smoothing word. But now thy beauty is proposed my fee, my proud heart sues, and prompts my tongue to speak. She looks scornfully at him. Teach not thy lip such scorn, for it was made for kissing, lady not for such contempt. If thy revengeful heart cannot forgive, lo, I lend thee this sharp-pointed sword, which, if thou please to hide in this true breast, and let the soul forth that adoreth thee, I lay it, naked to the deadly stroke, and humbly beg the death upon my knee. Nay, do not pause, for I did kill King Henry. He lays his breast open. She offers at it with his sword. But t'was thy beauty that provoked me. Nay, now dispatch, t'was I that stabbed young Edward. She again offered at his breast. But t'was thy heavenly face that set me on. She lets fall the sword. Take up the sword again, or take up me. Arise, dissembler. Though I wish thy death, I will not be thy executioner. Then bid me kill myself. And I will do it. I have already. That was in thy rage. Speak it again. And even with the word, this hand, which for thy love did kill thy love, shall for thy love kill a far truer love. To both their deaths shalt thou be accessory. I would I knew thy heart. Tis figured in my tongue. I fear me both are false. Then never was man true. Well, well, put up your sword. See, then, my peace is made. That shalt thou know hereafter. But shall I live in hope? All men, I hope, live so. Vouchsafe to wear this ring. To take is not to give. She puts on the ring. 
Look how this ring encompasseth thy finger. Even so thy breast encloseth my poor heart. Wear both of them, for both of them are thine. And if thy poor devoted servant may but beg one favour at thy gracious hand, thou dost confirm his happiness for ever. What is it? That it may please you leave these sad designs to him that has most cause to be a mourner, and presently repair to Crosby Place, where, after I have solemnly interred at Chertsey Monastery this noble king, and wet his grave with my repentant tears, I will with all expedient duty see you. For diverse unknown reasons I beseech you, grant me this boon. With all my heart, and much it joys me too to see you are become so penitent. Tressel and Berkeley, go along with me. Bid me farewell. Tis more than you deserve. But since you teach me how to flatter you, imagine I have said farewell already. Exeunt Lady Anne, Tress, and Burke. Sirs, take up the corpse. Toward Chertsey, noble lord? No, to Whitefriars. There attend my coming. Exeunt the rest with the corpse. <laughs> Was ever woman in this humour wooed? Was ever woman in this humour won? I'll have her. But I will not keep her long. What? I that killed her husband and his father? To take her in her heart's extremest hate, with curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes, the bleeding witness of her hatred by? Having got her conscience and these bars against me, and I no friends to back my suit withal, but the plain devil and dissembling looks, and yet to win her? All the world to nothing! Ha! Hath she forgot already that brave Prince Edward, her lord, whom I some three months since stabbed in my angry mood at Tewkesbury? A sweeter and a lovelier gentleman, framed in the prodigality of nature, young, valiant, wise, and no doubt right royal, the spacious world cannot again afford. And will she yet abase her eyes on me, that cropped the golden prime of this sweet prince, and made her widow to a woeful bed? On me, whose all not equals Edward's moiety? On me? that halt and am misshapen thus? My dukedom to a beggarly denier, I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life, she finds, although I cannot, myself to be a marvellous proper man. I'll be at charges for a looking-glass, and entertain a score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. Since I am crept in favour with myself, I will maintain it with some little cost. But first, I'll turn yon fellow in his grave and then return lamenting to my love. Shine out, fair son, till I have bought a glass, that I may see my shadow as I pass. Exit. Scene three. London. A room in the palace. Enter Queen Elizabeth, Lord Rivers, and Lord Grey. Have patience, madam. There's no doubt His Majesty will soon recover his accustomed health. In that you broke it ill, it makes him worse. Therefore, for God's sake, entertain good comfort, and cheer his grace with quick and merry eyes. If he were dead, what would be tied on me? No other harm but loss of such a lord. The loss of such a lord includes all harms. The heavens have blessed you with a goodly son, to be your comforter when he is gone. Ah, he is young and his minority is put into the trust of Richard Gloucester, a man that loves not me, nor none of you. Is it concluded he shall be protector? It is determined, not concluded yet, but so it must be if the king miscarry. Enter Buckingham and Stanley. Here come the lords of Buckingham and Stanley. Good time of day unto your royal grace. God make your majesty joyful as you have been. The Countess Richmond, good my lord of Stanley, to your good prayer will scarcely say amen. Yet, Stanley, notwithstanding she's your wife, and loves not me, be you, good lord, assured I hate not you for her proud arrogance. I do beseech you either not believe the envious slanders of her false accusers, or, if she be accused on true report, bear with her weakness, which I think proceeds from wayward sickness and no grounded malice. Saw you the king to-day, my lord of Stanley? But now the Duke of Buckingham and I are come from visiting his majesty. What likelihood of his amendment, lords? Madam, good hope. 
His grace speaks cheerfully. God grant him health. Did you confer with him? Ay, madam, he desires to make atonement between the Duke of Gloucester and your brothers, and between them and my Lord Chamberlain, and sent to warn them to his royal presence. Would all were well, but that will never be. I fear our happiness is at the height. Enter Gloucester, Hastings, and Dorset. They do me wrong, and I will not endure it. Who are they that complain unto the king that I, forsooth, am stern, and love them not? By holy Paul, they love his grace but lightly that fill his ears with such dissentious rumours. Because I cannot flatter, and look fair, smile in men's faces, smooth, deceive, and cog, duck with French nods and apish courtesy, I must be held a rancorous enemy. Cannot a plain man live and think no harm, but thus his simple truth must be abused with silken, sly, insinuating jacks? To who in all this presence speaks your grace? To thee that hath nor honesty nor grace. When have I injured thee? When done thee wrong? Or thee, or thee, or any of your faction? A plague upon you all! His royal grace, whom God preserve better than you would wish, cannot be quiet scarce a breathing while, but you must trouble him with lewd complaints. Brother of Gloucester, you mistake the matter. The king, on his own royal disposition, and not provoked by any suitor else, aiming belike at your interior hatred, that in your outward action shows itself against my children, brothers, and myself, makes him to send, that thereby he may gather the ground of your ill-will, and so remove it. I cannot tell. The world is grown so bad that wrens make prey where eagles dare not perch. Since every jack became a gentleman, there's many a gentle person made a jack. Come, come, we know your meaning, Brother Gloucester. You envy my advancement and my friends. God grant we never may have need of you. Meantime, God grants that we have need of you. Our brother is imprisoned by your means myself disgraced, and the nobility held in contempt, while great promotions are daily given to ennoble those that scarce some two days since were worth ennoble. By him that raised me to this careful height, from that contented hap which I enjoyed, I never did incense his majesty against the Duke of Clarence, but have been an earnest advocate to plead for him. My lord, you do me shameful injury, falsely to draw me in these vile suspects. You may deny that you were not the mean of my Lord Hastings' late imprisonment. She may, my lord, for— She may, Lord Rivers. Why, who knows not so? She may do more, sir, than denying that. She may help you to many fair preferments, and then deny her aiding hand therein, and lay those honours on your high desert. What, may she not? She may. I marry, may she— What? Marry, may she? What marry may she? Marry with a king, a bachelor, and a handsome stripling too. I wish your grandam had a worser match. My lord of Gloucester, I have too long borne your blunt upbraidings and your bitter scoffs. By heaven I will acquaint his majesty of those gross taunts that oft I have endured. I had rather be a country servant-maid than a great queen with this condition, to be so baited, scorned, and stormed at. Enter old Queen Margaret, behind. Small joy have I in being England's queen. And lessened be that small, God, I beseech him. Thy honour, state, and seat is due to me. What? Threat you me with telling of the king? Tell him, and spare not. Look. What I have said, I will avouch in presence of the king. I dare adventure to be sent to the tower. Tis time to speak. My pains are quite forgot. Out, devil! I do remember them too well. Thou killedst my husband Henry in the tower, and Edward, my poor son, at Tewkesbury. Ere you were queen, I, or your husband king, I was a pack-horse in his great affairs a weeder out of his proud adversaries, a liberal rewarder of his friends. 
To royalize his blood, I spilt mine own. Ay, and much better blood than his or thine. In all which time you and your husband Grey were factious for the house of Lancaster. And Rivers, so were you. Was not your husband in Margaret's battle at St. Albans slain? Let me put in your minds, if you forget, what you have been ere this and what you are, with all what I have been and what I am. A murderous villain, and so still thou art. Poor Clarence did forsake his father Warwick, ay, and forswore himself, which Jesu pardon. Which God revenge. To fight on Edward's party for the crown, and for his meed, poor lord, he is mewed up. I would to God my heart were flint like Edward's, or Edward's soft and pitiful like mine. I am too childish foolish for this world. Hie thee to hell for shame, and leave this world, thou cacodemon. There thy kingdom is. My lord of Gloucester, in those busy days, which here you urge to prove us enemies, we followed then our lord, our sovereign king. So should we you, if you should be our king. If I should be? Oh, I'd rather be a peddler. Far be it from my heart the thought thereof. As little joy, my lord, as you suppose you should enjoy, were you this country's king, as little joy you may suppose in me that I enjoy being the queen thereof. As little joy enjoys the queen thereof, for I am she, and altogether joyless. I can no longer hold me patient. Advancing. Hear me, you wrangling pirates! that fall out in sharing that which you have pilled from me. Which of you trembles not that looks on me? If not that I am queen, you bow like subjects, yet that by you deposed you quake like rebels. Ah, gentle villain, do not turn away. Foul, wrinkled witch, what makes thou in my sight? But repetition of what thou hast marred, that will I make before I let thee go. Wert thou not banished on pain of death? I was, but I do find more pain in banishment than death can yield me here by my abode. A husband and a son thou owest to me, and thou a kingdom. All of you allegiance. This sorrow that I have by right is yours and all the pleasures you usurp are mine. The curse my noble father laid on thee when thou didst crown his warlike brows with paper, and with thy scorns drewst rivers from his eyes, and then to dry them gavest the duke a clout, steeped in the faultless blood of pretty Rutland. His curses, then, from bitterness of soul denounced against thee, are all fallen upon thee, and God, not we, hath plagued thy bloody deed. So just is God to right the innocent. Oh, t'was the foulest deed to slay that babe, and the most merciless that e'er was heard of. Tyrants themselves wept when it was reported. No man hath prophesied revenge for it. Northumberland then present wept to see it. What, were you snarling all before I came? ready to catch each other by the throat, and turn you all your hatred now on me? Did York's dread curse prevail so much with heaven, that Henry's death, my lovely Edward's death, their kingdom's loss, my woeful banishment, should all but answer for that peevish brat? Can curses pierce the clouds and enter heaven? Why, then, Give way, dull clouds, to my quick curses. Though not by war, by surfeit die your king, as ours by murder, to make him a king. Edward thy son, that now is Prince of Wales, for Edward our son, that was Prince of Wales, die in his youth by like untimely violence. Thyself a queen, for me that was a queen, outlive thy glory like my wretched self. 
Long mayest thou live to wail thy children's death, and see another, as I see thee now, decked in thy rights, as thou art stalled in mine. Long die thy happy days before thy death, and after many lengthened hours of grief die neither mother, wife, nor England's queen. Rivers and Dorset, you were standers by, and so was thou, Lord Hastings, when my son was stabbed with bloody daggers. God, I pray him, that none of you may live his natural age, but by some unlooked accident cut off. Have done thy charm, thou hateful withered hag. And leave out thee. Stay, dog, for thou shalt hear me. If heaven have any grievous plague in store, exceeding those that I can wish upon thee, oh, let them keep it till thy sins be ripe and then hurl down their indignation on thee, the troubler of the poor world's peace. The worm of conscience still be gnaw thy soul. Thy friends suspect for traitors while thou livest, and take deep traitors for thy dearest friends. No sleep close up that deadly eye of thine, unless it be while some tormenting dream affrights thee with a hell of ugly devils. Thou elvish-marked, abortive, rooting hog! Thou that wast sealed in thy nativity, the slave of nature and the son of hell! Thou slander of thy heavy mother's womb! Thou loathed issue of thy father's loins! Thou rag of honour, thou detested— Margaret. Richard! Ha! I call thee not. I cry thee mercy, then, for I did think thou hadst called me all these bitter names. Why, so I did, but looked for no reply. Oh, let me make the period to my curse. Tis done by me, and ends in Margaret. Thus have you breathed your curse against yourself. Poor painted queen, vain flourish of my fortune. Why strewst thou sugar on that bottled spider, whose deadly web ensnareth thee about? Fool, fool, thou wet'st a knife to kill thyself. The day will come that thou shalt wish for me to help thee curse this poisonous bunch-backed toad. False boding woman, end thy frantic curse, lest to thy harm thou move our patience. Foul shame upon you! You have all moved mine. Were you well served, you would be taught your duty. To serve me well, you all should do me duty. Teach me to be your queen, and you my subjects. Oh, serve me well, and teach yourselves that duty. Dispute not with her. She is a lunatic. Peace, Master Marquis. You are malapert. Your fire-new stamp of honour is scarce current. Oh, that your young nobility could judge what twere to lose it and be miserable. They that stand high have many blasts to shake them, and if they fall they dash themselves to pieces. Good counsel, Mary. Learn it, learn it, Marquis. It touches you, my lord, as much as me. I and much more. But I was born so high, our airy buildeth in the cedar's top, and dallies with the wind, and scorns the sun. And turns the sun to shade, alas, alas! Witness my son now in the shade of death, whose bright outshining beams thy cloudy wrath hath in eternal darkness folded up. Your eyrie buildeth in our eyrie's nest. O oh, God that seized it, do not suffer it, as it is one with blood, lost be it so. Peace, peace, for shame, if not for charity. Urge neither charity nor shame to me. Uncharitably with me have you dealt. 
and shamefully my hopes by you are butchered my charity is outrage life my shame and in that shame still live my sorrow's rage have done have done O oh, princely Buckingham, I'll kiss thy hand in sign of league and amity with thee. Now fair befall thee and thy noble house. Thy garments are not spotted with our blood, nor thou within the compass of my curse. Nor no one here, for curses never pass the lips of those that breathe them in the air. I will not think but they ascend the sky. And there awake God's gentle sleeping peace. O oh, Buckingham, take heed of yonder dog. Look, when he fawns, he bites, and when he bites, his venom tooth will rankle to the death. Have not to do with him, beware of him. Sin, death, and hell have set their marks on him, and all their ministers attend on him. What does she say, my lord of Buckingham? Nothing that I respect, my gracious lord. What? Dost thou scorn me for my gentle counsel, And soothe the devil that I warn thee from? Oh, but remember this another day, When he shall split thy very heart with sorrow, And say, poor Margaret was a prophetess. Live each of you the subjects to his hate, And he to yours, and all of you to gods exit my hair does stand on end to hear her curses and so doth mine i muse why she's at liberty i cannot blame her by god's holy mother she hath had too much wrong and i repent my part thereof that i have done to her i never did her any to my knowledge yet you have all the vantage of her wrong i was too hot to do somebody good that is too cold in thinking of it now Marry, as for Clarence, he is well repaid. He is franked up to fatting for his pains. God pardon them that are the cause thereof. A virtuous and a Christian-like conclusion, To pray for them that hath done scathe to us. So do I ever, being well advised. Aside. For had I cursed now, I had cursed myself. Enter Catesby. Madam, his majesty doth call for you. And for your grace, and you, my noble lords. Kate's be I come. Lords, will you go with me? We wait upon your grace. Exeunt all but Gloucester. I do the wrong, and first begin to brawl. The secret mischiefs that I set abroach I lay unto the grievous charge of others. Clarence, whom I indeed have cast in darkness, I do beweep to many simple gulls, namely to Stanley, Hastings, Buckingham, and tell them tis the Queen and her allies that stir the King against the Duke my brother. Now they believe it, and withal wet me to be revenged on rivers, Vaughan, Grey. But then I sigh, and with a piece of scripture tell them that God bids us do good for evil. And thus I clothe my naked villainy with odd old ends stolen forth of holy writ, and seem a saint when most I play the devil. But soft, here come my executioners. Enter two murderers. How now, my hardy, stout, resolved mates? Are you now going to dispatch this thing? We are, my lord, and come to have the warrant that we may be admitted where he is. Well, thought upon, I have it here about me. Gives the warrant. When you have done, repair to Crosby Place. But, sirs, be sudden in the execution. Withal, obdurate, do not hear him plead. For Clarence is well spoken, and perhaps may move your hearts to pity, if you mark him. Tut, tut, my lord. We will not stand to prate. Talkers are no good doers. Be assured we go to use our hands and not our tongues. Your eyes drop millstones when fools' eyes fall tears. I like you, lads, about your business straight. Go, go, dispatch. We will, my noble lord. Exeunt. Scene four. London. A room in the tower. Enter Clarence and Brackenbury. Why looks your grace so heavily today? Oh, I have passed a miserable night, so full of fearful dreams, of ugly sights, 
that as I am a Christian faithful man, I would not spend another such a night, though twere to buy a world of happy days, so full of dismal terror was the time. What was your dream, my lord? I pray you tell me. Methoughts that I had broken from the tower, and was embarked to cross to Burgundy, and in my company my brother Gloucester, who from my cabin tempted me to walk upon the hatches. Thence we looked toward England, and sighted up a thousand heavy times during the wars of York and Lancaster that had befallen us. As we paced along upon the giddy footing of the hatches, we thought that Gloucester stumbled, and in falling struck me the thought to stay him overboard into the tumbling billows of the main. O oh Lord, methought what pain it was to drown, what dreadful noise of waters in my ears, what sights of ugly death within my eyes. Methought I saw a thousand fearful wrecks, a thousand men that fishes gnawed upon, wedges of gold, great anchors, heaps of pearl, inestimable stones, unvalued jewels, all scattered in the bottom of the sea. Some lay in dead men's skulls, and in the holes where eyes did once inhabit, there were crept, as twere in scorn of eyes, reflecting gems that wooed the slimy bottom of the deep, and mocked the dead bones that lay scattered by. Had you such leisure in the time of death to gaze upon these secrets of the deep? Methought I had, and often did I strive to yield the ghost. But still the envious flood stopped in my soul, and would not let it forth to find the empty vast and wandering air, but smothered it within my panting bulk, who almost burst to belch it in the sea. Await you not in this sore agony? No, no, my dream was lengthened after life. Oh, then began the tempest to my soul. I passed, methought, the melancholy flood with that grim ferryman which poets write of unto the kingdom of perpetual night. The first that there did greet my stranger soul was my great father-in-law, renowned Warwick, who spake aloud, What scourge for perjury can this dark monarchy afford false Clarence? And so he vanished. Then came wandering by a shadow like an angel, with bright hair dabbled in blood, and he shrieked out aloud, Clarence is come, false fleeting perjured Clarence, that stabbed me in the field by Tewkesbury. Seize on him, furies, take him to your torments. With that, methought, a legion of foul fiends environed me, and howled in mine ears such hideous cries, that with the very noise I trembling waked, and for a season after could not believe but that I was in hell. Such terrible impression made my dream. No marvel, Lord, though it affrighted you. I am afraid, methinks, to hear you tell it. Ah, Brackenbury, I have done these things that now give evidence against my soul for Edward's sake, and see how he requites me. O oh God, if my deep prayers cannot appease thee, but thou wilt be avenged on my misdeeds, yet execute thy wrath in me alone. Oh, spare my guiltless wife and my poor children. Keeper, I prithee sit by me a while. My soul is heavy, and I fain would sleep. I will, my lord. God give your grace good rest. Clarence reposes himself on a chair. Sorrow breaks seasons and reposing hours, makes the night morning and the noontide night. Princes have but their titles for their glories, an outward honor for an inward toil, and for unfelt imaginations they often feel a world of restless cares, so that between their titles and low name there's nothing differs but the outward fame. Enter the two murderers. Ho! Oh, who's here? What wouldst thou, fellow, and how camest thou hither? I would speak with Clarence, and I came hither on my legs. What, so brief? "'Tis better, sir, than to be tedious. Let him see our commission and talk no more. A paper is delivered to Brackenbury, who reads it. "'I am, in this, commanded to deliver the noble Duke of Clarence to your hands. I will not reason what is meant hereby, because I will be guiltless of the meaning. There lies the Duke asleep, and there the keys. I'll to the King, and signify to him that thus I have resigned to you my charge.' You may, sir, tis a point of wisdom. 
Fare you well. Exit Brackenbury. What? Shall we stab him as he sleeps? No. He'll say twas done cowardly when he wakes. When he wakes? Why, fool, he shall never wake until the great judgment day. Why, then he'll say we stabbed him sleeping. The urging of that word judgment has bred a kind of remorse in me. What, art thou afraid? Not to kill him, having a warrant for it, but to be damned for killing him, from the which no warrant can defend me. I thought thou hadst been resolute. So I am, to let him live. I'll back to the Duke of Gloucester, and tell him so. Nay, I pray thee, stay a little. I hope my holy humour will change. It was one to hold me, but while one tells twenty. How dost thou feel thyself now? Face, some certain dregs of conscience are yet within me. Remember our reward when the deed's done. Thounds, he dies. I had forgot the reward. Where's thy conscience now? Oh, in the Duke of Gloucester's purse. So when he opens his purse, to give us our reward, thy conscience flies out? Tis no matter. Let it go. There's few or none will entertain it. What if it come to thee again? I'll not meddle with it. It makes a man coward. A man cannot steal, but it accuses him. A man cannot swear, but it checks him. A man cannot lie with his neighbor's wife, but it detects him. Tis a blushing, shamefaced spirit that mutinies in a man's bosom. It fills a man full of obstacles. It made me once restore a purse of gold that by chance I found. It beggars any man that keeps it. It is turned out of towns and cities for a dangerous thing. And every man that means to live well endeavors to trust to himself and live without it. Zounds! Tis even now at my elbow persuading me not to kill the duke. Take the devil in thy mind, and believe him not. He would insinuate with thee but to make thee sigh. I am strong-framed. He cannot prevail with me. Spoke like a tall man that respects thy reputation. Come, shall we fall to work? Take him on the costard with the hilts of thy sword, and then throw him in the malmsey butt in the next room. Oh, excellent device, and make a sup of him. Soft, he wakes. Strike! No, we'll reason with him. Oh! Where art thou, keeper? Give me a cup of wine. You shall have wine enough, my lord, anon. In God's name, what art thou? A man, as you are. But not as I am, royal. Nor you as we are, loyal. Thy voice is thunder, but thy looks are humble. My voice is now the king's, my looks mine own. How darkly and how deadly dost thou speak! Your eyes do menace me. Why look you pale? Who sent you hither? Wherefore do you come? To, to, to... To murder me. Ay, ay. Ay. You scarcely have the hearts to tell me so, and therefore cannot have the hearts to do it. Wherein, my friends, have I offended you? Offended us you have not, but the king. I shall be reconciled to him again. Never, my lord. Therefore prepare to die. Are you drawn forth among a world of men to slay the innocent? What is my offence? Where is the evidence that doth accuse me? What lawful quest have given their verdict up unto the frowning judge, or who pronounced the bitter sentence of poor Clarence's death? Before I be convict by course of law, to threaten me with death is most unlawful. I charge you, as you hope to have redemption by Christ's dear blood shed for our grievous sins, that you depart and lay no hands on me. The deed you undertake is damnable. What we will do? We do upon command. And he that has commanded is our king. Erroneous vassals! The great king of kings hath in the table of his law commanded that thou shalt do no murder. Will you then spurn at his edict and fulfil a man's? Take heed, for he holds vengeance in his hand to hurl upon their heads that break his law. And that same vengeance does he hurl on thee, for false forswearing and for murder too. Thou didst receive the sacramental fight and quarrel of the house of Lancaster. And, like a traitor to the name of God, didst break that vow, and with thy treacherous blade unrippest the bowels of thy sovereign son. Whom thou wast sworn to cherish and defend. How canst thou urge God's dreadful law to us, when thou hast broke it on such a dear degree? Alas, for whose sake did I that ill deed? For Edward, for my brother, for his sake. He sends you not to murder me for this, for in that sin he is as deep as I. If God will be avenged for the deed, O oh, know you yet he doth it publicly, 
Take not the quarrel from his powerful arm. He needs no indirect or lawless course to cut off those that have offended him. Who made thee then a bloody minister, when gallant springing brave Plantagenet, that princely novice was struck dead by thee? My brother's love, the devil, and my rage. Thy brother's love, our duty, and thy faults. Provoke us hither now to slaughter thee. If you do love my brother, hate not me. I am his brother, and I love him well. If you are hired for mead, go back again, and I will send you to my brother Gloucester, who shall reward you better for my life than Edward will for tidings of my death. You are deceived. Your brother Gloucester hates you. Oh, no. He loves me, and he holds me dear. Go you to him from me. Aye, so we will. Tell him when that our princely father York blessed his three sons with his victorious arm and charged us from his soul to love each other. He little thought of this divided friendship. Bid Gloucester think of this, and he will weep. Aye, millstones, as he'd lessened us to weep. Oh, do not slander him, for he is kind. Right, as snow in harvest. Come, you deceive yourself. Tis he that sends us to destroy you here. It cannot be. For he bewept my fortune, and hugged me in his arms, and swore with sobs that he would labour my delivery. Why, so he doth, when he delivers you from this earth's thraldom to the joys of heaven. Make peace with God, for you must die, my lord. Have you that holy feeling in your souls to counsel me to make my peace with God, and are you yet to your own souls so blind that you will war with God by murdering me? Oh, sirs, consider, they that set you on to do this deed will hate you for the deed. What shall we do? Relent and save your souls. Relent? Tis cowardly and womanish. Not to relent is beastly, savage, devilish. Which of you, if you were a prince's son, being pent from liberty as I am now, if two such murderers as yourselves came to you, would not entreat for life? My friend, I spy some pity in thy looks. Oh, if thine eye be not a flatterer, come thou on my side and entreat for me, as you would beg were you in my distress. A begging prince, what beggar pities not? Look behind you, my lord. Stabs him. Take that and that. If all this will not do, I'll drown you in the Malmsey butt within. Exit with the body. A bloody deed, and desperately dispatched. How fain, like Pilate, would I wash my hands of this most grievous murder. Re-enter first murderer. How now? What meanest thou that thou helpest me not? By heavens the duke shall know how slack you have been. I would he knew that I had saved his brother. Take thou the fee, and tell him what I say. For I repent me that the duke is slain. Exit. So do not I. Go, coward, as thou art. Well, I'll go hide the body in some hole, Till that the duke give order for his burial. And when I have my mead, I will away, For this will out, and then I must not stay. Exit. End of Act One Act Two of Richard the Third by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, London, a room in the palace. Enter King Edward, led in sick, Queen Elizabeth, Dorset, Rivers, Hastings, Buckingham, Grey, and others. Why so, now I have done a good day's work, You peers continue this united league, I every day expect an ambassage From my Redeemer to redeem me hence, And more at peace my soul shall part to heaven, Since I have made my friends at peace on earth. Rivers and Hastings, take each other's hand, Dissemble not your hatred, swear your love. By heaven, my soul is purged from grudging hate, And with my hand I seal my true heart's love. So thrive I, as I truly swear the like. Take heed you dally not before your king, Lest he that is the supreme king of kings Confound your hidden falsehood and award, Either of you to be the other's end. 
so prosper I, as I swear perfect love. And I, as I love Hastings with my heart. Madam, yourself is not exempt from this, nor you, son Dorset, Buckingham, nor you. You have been factious one against the other. Wife, love Lord Hastings, let him kiss your hand. And what you do, do it unfeignedly. There, Hastings, I will never more remember our former hatred. So thrive I and mine. Dorset, embrace him. Hastings, love Lord Marquis. This interchange of love, I here protest, upon my part shall be inviolable. And so swear I. Embraces Dorset. Now, princely Buckingham, seal thou this league, with thy embracements to my wife's allies, and make me happy in your unity. Whenever Buckingham doth turn his hate upon your grace, to the queen, but with all duteous love doth cherish you and yours, God punish me with hate in those where I expect most love. When I have most need to employ a friend, and most assured that he is a friend, deep, hollow, treacherous, and full of guile be he unto me. This do I beg of heaven when I am curled in love to you or yours. Embracing rivers, etc. A pleasing, cordial, princely Buckingham, is this thy vow unto my sickly heart? There wanteth now our brother Gloucester here to make the blessed period of this peace. And in good time, here comes the noble duke. Enter Gloucester. Good morrow to my sovereign king and queen, and princely peers, a happy time of day. Happy indeed, as we have spent the day. Gloucester, we have done deeds of charity. Make peace of enmity, fair love of hate, between these swelling wrong insensate peers. A blessed labour, my most sovereign lord. Among this princely heap, if any here, by false intelligence or wrong surmise, hold me a foe, if I unwittingly or in my rage have aught committed that is hardly borne to any in this presence, I desire to reconcile me to his friendly peace. Tis death to me to be at enmity. I hate it, and desire all good men's love. First, madam, I entreat true peace of you, which I will purchase with my duteous service. Of you, my noble cousin Buckingham, if ever any grudge were lodged between us, of you and you, Lord Rivers and of Dorset, that all, without desert, have frowned on me. Of you, Lord Woodville, and Lord Scales of you, dukes, earls, lords, gentlemen, indeed, of all. I do not know that Englishman alive with whom my soul is any jot at odds more than the infant that is born to-night. I thank my God for my humility. A holy day shall this be kept hereafter. I would to God all strifes were well compounded. My sovereign lord, I do beseech your highness to take our brother Clarence to your grace. Why, madam, have I offered love for this to be so flouted in this royal presence? Who knows not that the gentle duke is dead? They all start. You do him injury to scorn his corpse. Who knows not he is dead? Who knows he is? All seeing heaven, what a world is this? Look I so pale, Lord Dorset, as the rest? Ay, my good lord, and no man in the presence but his red colour hath forsook his cheeks. Is Clarence dead? The order was reversed. But he, poor man, by your first order died, and that a winged mercury did bear. Some tardy cripple bore the countermand that came too lag to see him buried. God grant that some less noble and less loyal, nearer in bloody thoughts and not in blood, deserve not worse than wretched Clarence did, and yet go current from suspicion. Enter Stanley. A boon, my sovereign, for my service done. I prithee peace. My soul is full of sorrow. I will not rise unless your highness hear me. Then say at once, what is it thou requestest? The forfeit, sovereign, of my servant's life, who slew to-day a riotous gentleman, lately attendant on the Duke of Norfolk. Have I a tongue to do my brother's death, and shall that tongue give pardon to a slave? My brother killed no man. His fault was thought, and yet his punishment was bitter death. Who sued to me for him, who in my wrath 
kneeled at my feet and bid me be advised who spoke of brotherhood who spoke of love who told me how the poor soul did forsake the mighty warwick and did fight for me who told me in the field at tewkesbury when oxford had me down he rescued me and said dear brother live and be a king who told me when we both lay in the field frozen almost to death how he did lap me, even in his garments, and did give himself, all thin and naked to the numb-cold night, all this from my remembrance brutish wrath, sinfully plucked, and not a man of you had so much grace to put it in my mind. But when your carters or your waiting vassals have done a drunken slaughter and defaced the precious image of our dear Redeemer, you straighter on your knees for pardon, pardon, and I unjustly too must grant it you. But for my brother not a man would speak, nor I ungracious speak unto myself, for him, poor soul, the proudest of you all, have been beholding to him in his life, yet none of you would once beg for his life. O oh God, I fear thy justice will take hold, On me, on you, and mine, and yours for this. Come, Hastings, help me to my closet. Ah, poor Clarence! Exeunt King, Queen, Hastings, Rivers, Dorset, and Grey. This is the fruit of rashness. Marked you not how that the guilty kindred of the Queen Looked pale when they did hear of Clarence's death? O, oh, they did urge it still unto the King. God! We'll revenge it. Come, lords, will you go to comfort Edward with our company? We wait upon your grace. Exeunt. Scene two. Another room in the palace. Enter the Duchess of York, with a son and daughter of Clarence. Good grandam, tell us, is our father dead? No, boy. Why do you weep so oft, and beat your breast, and cry, O oh, Clarence, my unhappy son? Why do you look on us, and shake your head, and call us orphans, wretches, castaways, if that our noble father were alive? My pretty cousins, you mistake me both. I do lament the sickness of the king, as loath to lose him, not your father's death. It were lost sorrow to wail one that's lost. Then you conclude, my grandam, he is dead. The king, mine uncle, is to blame for this. God will revenge it, whom I will importune with earnest prayers all to that effect. And so will I. Peace, children, peace. The king doth love you well. Incapable and shallow innocence, you cannot guess who caused your father's death. Grandam, we can. For my good uncle Gloucester told me, the king, provoked to it by the queen, devised impeachments to imprison him. And when my uncle told me so, he wept and pitied me, and kindly kissed my cheek, bade me rely on him as on my father and he would love me dearly as his child. Oh, that deceit should steal such gentle shape, and with a virtuous visard hide deep vice. He is my son, ay, and therein my shame, yet from my dugs he drew not this deceit. Think you my uncle did dissemble, Grandam? Ay, boy. I cannot think it. Hark! What noise is this? Enter Queen Elizabeth, distractedly. Rivers and Dorset following her. Ah, who shall hinder me to wail and weep, to chide my fortune and torment myself? I'll join with black despair against my soul, and to myself become an enemy. What means this scene of rude impatience? To make an act of tragic violence. Edward, my lord, thy son, our king, is dead. Why grow the branches when the root is gone? Why wither not the leaves that want their sap? If you will live, lament. If die, be brief, that our swift-winged souls may catch the kings, or like obedient subjects follow him to his new kingdom of perpetual rest. Ah, so much interest have I in thy sorrow, as I had title in thy noble husband. I have bewept a worthy husband's death and lived by looking on his images. But now two mirrors of his princely semblance are cracked in pieces by malignant death, and I for comfort have but one false glass that grieves me when I see my shame in him. Thou art a widow, 
Yet thou art a mother, and hast the comfort of thy children left. But death hath snatched my husband from mine arms, and plucked two crutches from my feeble hands, Clarence and Edward. O oh, what cause have I, thine being but a moiety of my moan, to overgo thy woes and drown thy cries? Ah, aunt, you wept not for our father's death. How can we aid you with our kindred tears? Our fatherless distress was left unmourned. Your widow Dola likewise be unwept. Give me no help in lamentation. I am not barren to bring forth complaints. All springs reduce their currents to mine eyes, that I, being governed by the watery moon, may send forth plenteous tears to drown the world. Ah, for my husband, for my dear Lord Edward! Ah, for our father, for our dear Lord Clarence! Alas, for both, both mine, Edward and Clarence! What stay had I but Edward, and he's gone? What stay had we but Clarence, and he's gone? What stays had I but they, and they are gone? Was ever widow had so dear a loss? Were never orphans had so dear a loss? Was never mother had so dear a loss? Alas, I am the mother of these griefs. Their woes are parcelled, mine is general. She for an Edward weeps, and so do I. I for a Clarence weep, so doth not she. These babes for Clarence weep, and so do I. I for an Edward weep, so do not they. Alas, you three on me, threefold distressed, pour all your tears. I am your sorrow's nurse, and I will pamper it with lamentation. Comfort, dear mother. God is much displeased that you take with unthankfulness his doing. In common worldly things tis called ungrateful, with done unwillingness to repay a debt with which a bounteous hand was kindly lent, much more to be thus opposite with heaven, for it requires the royal debt it lent you. Madam, bethink you like a careful mother, of the young prince your son. Send straight for him, let him be crowned, in him your comfort lives. Drown desperate sorrow in dead Edward's grave, and plant your joys in living Edward's throne. Enter Gloucester, Buckingham, Stanley, Hastings, Radcliffe, and others. Sister, have comfort. All of us have cause to wail the dimming of our shining star, but none can help our harms by wailing them. Madam, my mother, I do cry you mercy, I did not see your grace. Humbly on my knee I crave your blessing. God bless thee and put meekness in thy breast, love, charity, obedience, and true duty. Amen. Aside. And make me die a good old man. That is the butt-end of a mother's blessing. I marvel that her grace did leave it out. You cloudy princes and heart-sorrowing peers that bear this heavy mutual load of moan, now cheer each other in each other's love. Though we have spent our harvest of this king, we are to reap the harvest of his son. The broken rancour of your high-sworn hearts, but lately splintered, knit, and joined together, must gently be preserved, cherished, and kept. Me seemeth good that, with some little train, forthwith from Ludlow, the young prince be fetched, hither to London to be crowned our king. Why with some little train, my lord of Buckingham? Marry, my lord, lest by a multitude the new healed wound of malice should break out which would be so much the more dangerous by how much the estate is green and yet ungoverned, where every horse bears his commanding rein and may direct his course as please himself, as well the fear of harm as harm apparent, in my opinion, ought to be prevented. I hope the king made peace with all of us, and the compact is firm and true in me. And so in me, and so I think in all. Yet, since it is but green, it should be put to no apparent likelihood of breach, which, haply, by much company, might be urged. Therefore I say with noble Buckingham that it is meet so few should fetch the prince. And so say I. Then be it so, and go we to determine who they shall be that straight shall post to Ludlow. Madam, and you, my mother, will you go to give your censures in this business? Exeunt all but Buckingham and Gloucester. My lord, whoever journeys to the prince, 
for god's sake let not us two stay at home for by the way i'll sort occasion as index to the story we late talked of to part the queen's proud kindred from the prince my other self my counsel's consistory my oracle my prophet my dear cousin i as a child will go by thy direction toward ludlow then for we'll not stay behind exeunt scene three london a street enter two citizens meeting good morrow neighbour whither away so fast i promise you i scarcely know myself hear you the news abroad yes that the king is dead ill news by your lady seldom comes the better i fear i fear twill prove a giddy world enter sir citizen neighbours god speed give you good morrow sir doth the news hold of good king edward's death ay sir it is too true god help the while then masters look to see a troublous world no no by god's good grace his son shall reign woe to that land that's governed by a child in him there's a hope of government which in his knowledge counsel under him and in his full and ripened years himself no doubt shall then and till then govern well so stood the state when henry the sixth was crowned in paris but at nine months old stood the state so no no good friends god what for then this land was famously enriched with politic grave counsel then the king had virtuous uncles to protect his grace why so has this both by his father and mother better it were they all came by his father or by his father there were none at all for emulation who shall now be nearest will touch us all too near if god prevent not oh full of danger is the duke of gloucester and the queen's sons and brothers hot and proud and were they to be ruled and not to rule this sickly land might solace as before come come we fear the worst all will be well when clouds are seen wise men put on their cloaks when great leaves fall then winter is at hand when the sun sets who doth not look for night untimely storms make men expect a dearth all may be well but if god sort it so tis more than we deserve or i expect truly the hearts of men are full of fear you cannot reason almost with a man that looks not heavily and full of dread before the days of change still is it so by a divine instinct men's minds mistrust ensuing danger as by proof we see the water swell before a boisterous storm but leave it all to god whither away mary we were sent for to the justices then so was i i'll bear you company exeunt scene four london a room in the palace enter the archbishop of york the young duke of york queen elizabeth and the duchess of york last night i hear they at northampton lay and at stony stratford they do rest to-night to-morrow or next day they will be here i long with all my heart to see the prince i hope he is much grown since last i saw him but i hear no they say my son of york has almost overtaken him in his growth ay mother but i would not have it so why my good cousin it is good to grow grandam one night as we did sit at supper my uncle rivers talked how i did grow more than my brother ay quoth my uncle gloucester small herbs have grace great weeds do grow apace and since methinks i would not grow so fast because sweet flowers are slow and weeds make haste good faith good faith the saying did not hold in him that did object the same to thee he was the wretchedest thing when he was young so long a growing and so leisurely that if his rule were true he should be gracious and so no doubt he is my gracious madam i hope he is but yet let mothers doubt now by my troth if i had been remembered i could have given my uncle's grace a flout to touch his growth nearer than he touched mine how my young york i prithee let me hear it mary they say my uncle grew so fast that he could not a crust at two hours old twas full two years ere i could get a tooth grandam this would have been a biting jest i prithee pretty york who told thee this grandam his nurse his nurse why she was dead ere thou wast born if twere not she i cannot tell who told me a parlous boy go to you are too shrewd good madam be not angry with the child pitchers have ears here comes a messenger 
Enter a messenger. What news? Such news, my lord, as grieves me to report. How doth the prince? Well, madam, and in health. What is thy news? Lord Rivers and Lord Grey are sent to Pomfret, with them Sir Thomas Vaughan. Prisoners. Who hath committed them? The mighty dukes Gloucester and Buckingham. For what offence? The sum of all I can I have disclosed. Why or for what the nobles were committed is all unknown to me, my gracious lady. Ah, me! I see the ruin of my house. The tiger now hath seized the gentle hind. Insulting tyranny begins to jet upon the innocent and all is thrown. Welcome destruction, blood, and massacre. I see, as in a map, the end of all. Accursed and unquiet wrangling days, how many of you have mine eyes beheld! My husband lost his life to get the crown, and often up and down my sons were tossed for me to joy and weep their gain and loss, and being seated and domestic broils clean overblown, themselves the conquerors make war upon themselves, brother to brother, blood to blood, self against self. O oh, Posterous and frantic outrage, end thy damned spleen, or let me die to look on death no more. Come, come, my boy, we will to sanctuary. Madam, farewell. Stay, I will go with you. You have no cause. To the queen. My gracious lady, go, and thither bear your treasure and your goods. For my part, I'll resign unto your grace, the seal I keep and so be tied to me, as well I tender you and all of yours. Go, I'll conduct you to the sanctuary. Exeunt End of Act Two Act Three of Richard III by William Shakespeare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One, London, a street. The trumpets sound. Enter the Prince of Wales, Gloucester, Buckingham, Catesby, Cardinal Berchier, and others. Welcome, sweet Prince, to London, to your chamber. Welcome, dear cousin, my thoughts sovereign. The weary way hath made you melancholy. No, uncle, but our crosses on the way have made it tedious, wearisome, and heavy. I want more uncles here to welcome me. <sighs> Sweet prince, the untainted virtue of your years hath not yet dived into the world's deceit. Nor more can you distinguish of a man than of his outward show, which, God he knows, seldom nor never jumpeth with the heart. Those uncles which you want were dangerous. Your grace attended to their sugared words, but looked not on the poison of their hearts. God keep you from them, and from such false friends. God keep me from false friends, but they were none. My lord, the Mayor of London comes to greet you. Enter the Lord Mayor and his train. God bless your grace with health and happy days. I thank you, good my lord, and thank you all. Exeunt Mayor, etc. I thought my mother and my brother York would long ere this have met us on the way. Fie, what a slug is Hastings, that he comes not to tell us whether they will come or no. And in good time, here comes the sweating lord. Enter Hastings. Welcome, my lord. What? Will our mother come? On what occasion, God he knows, not I. The queen, your mother, and your brother York have taken sanctuary. The tender prince would fain have come with me to meet your grace, but by his mother was perforce withheld. Why, what an indirect and peevish course is this of hers! Lord Cardinal, will your grace persuade the Queen to send the Duke of York unto his princely brother presently? If she deny, Lord Hastings, go with him, and from her jealous arms pluck him perforce. My Lord of Buckingham, if my weak oratory can from his mother win the Duke of York, anon expect him here. But if she be obdurate to mild entreaties, God in heaven forbid we should infringe the holy privilege of blessed sanctuary. Not for all this land would I be guilty of so deep a sin. You are too senseless obstinate, my lord. 
too ceremonious and traditional weigh it but with the grossness of this age you break not sanctuary in seizing him the benefit thereof is always granted to those whose dealings have deserved the place and those who have the wit to claim the place this prince hath neither claimed it nor deserved it and therefore in mine opinion cannot have it then taking him from thence that is not there you break no privilege nor charter there oft i have heard of sanctuary men but sanctuary children ne'er till now my lord you shall overrule my mind for once come on lord hastings will you go with me i go my lord good lords make all the speedy haste you may exeunt cardinal and hastings say uncle gloucester if our brother come where shall we sojourn till our coronation where it seems best unto your royal self if i may counsel you some day or two your highness shall repose you at the tower then where you please and shall be thought most fit for your best health and recreation i do not like the tower of any place did julius caesar build that place my lord he did my gracious lord begin that place which since succeeding ages have re-edified is it upon record or else reported successively from age to age he built it upon record my gracious lord but say my lord it were not registered methinks the truth should live from age to age as to were retailed to all posterity even to the general all-ending day aside so wise so young they say do never live long what say you uncle i say without characters fame lives long aside thus like the formal vice iniquity i moralize two meanings in one word that julius caesar was a famous man with what his valour did enrich his wit his wit set down to make his valour live death makes no conquest of this conqueror for now he lives in fame though not in life i'll tell you what my cousin buckingham what my gracious lord and if i live until i be a man i'll win our ancient right in france again or die a soldier as i lived a king aside short summers lightly have a forward spring and now in good time here comes the duke of york enter york hastings and a cardinal richard of york how fares our loving brother well my dread lord so must i call you now ay brother to our grief as it is yours too late he died that might have kept that title which by his death has lost much majesty how fares our cousin noble lord of york i thank you gentle uncle oh my lord you said that idle weeds are fast in growth the prince my brother hath outgrown me far he hath my lord and therefore is he idle oh my fair cousin i must not say so then he is more beholding to you than i he may command me as my sovereign but you have power in me as in a kinsman i pray you uncle give me this dagger my dagger little cousin with all my heart a beggar brother of my kind uncle that i know will give and being but a toy which is no grief to give a greater gift than that i'll give my cousin a greater gift oh that's the sword to it ay gentle cousin were it light enough oh then i see you will part with but light gifts in weightier things you'll say a beggar nay it is too heavy for your grace to wear i weigh it lightly were it heavier what would you have my weapon little lord i would that i might thank you as you call me how little my lord of york will still be cross in talk uncle your grace knows how to bear with him you mean to bear me not to bear with me uncle my brother mocks both you and me because that i am little like an ape he thinks that you should bear me on your shoulders with what a sharp provided wit he reasons to mitigate the scorn he gives his uncle he prettily and aptly taunts himself so cunning and so young is wonderful my lord wilt please you pass along myself and my good cousin buckingham will to your mother to entreat of her to meet you at the tower and welcome you what will you go unto the tower my lord my lord protector needs will have it so 
I shall not sleep in quiet at the tower. Why, what should you fear? Mary, my Uncle Clarence's angry ghost. My grandam told me he was murdered there. I fear no uncle's dead. Nor none that live, I hope. And if they live, I hope I need not fear. But come, my lord, and with a heavy heart, thinking on them, go I unto the tower. Senate. Exeunt Prince, York, Hastings, Cardinal, and Attendants. Think you, my lord, this little prating York was not incensed by his subtle mother to taunt and scorn you thus opprobriously? No doubt, no doubt. Oh, tis a parlous boy, bold, quick, ingenious, forward, capable. He is all the mothers from the top to toe. Well, let them rest. Come hither, Catesby. Thou art sworn as deeply to effect what we intend, as closely to conceal what we impart. Thou knowest our reasons urged upon the way. What think'st thou? Is it not an easy matter to make William Lord Hastings of our mind? For the instalment of this noble duke in the seat royal of this famous isle. He, for his father's sake, so loves the prince that he will not be one to aught against him. What think'st thou then of Stanley, will not he? He will do all in all as Hastings doth. Will then no more but this. Go, gentle Catesby, and as it were far off, sound thou, Lord Hastings, how he doth stand affected to our purpose, and summon him to-morrow to the tower to sit about the coronation. If thou dost find him tractable to us, encourage him, and tell him all our reasons, if he be leaden icy cold unwilling be thou so too and so break off the talk and give us notice of his inclination for we to-morrow hold divided counsels wherein thyself shall highly be employed commend me to lord william tell him catesby his ancient knot of dangerous adversaries to-morrow are let blood at pomfret castle and bid my lord for joy of this good news Give Mistress Shaw one gentle kiss the more. Good Catesby, go. Effect this business soundly. My good lords both, with all the heat I can. Shall we hear from you, Catesby, ere we sleep? You shall, my lord. At Crosby Place, there shall you find us both. Exit Catesby. And now, my lord, what shall we do if we perceive that Lord Hastings will not yield to our complots? Chop off his head, man! <laughs> Somewhat we will do. And look. When I am king, claim thou of me the earldom of Hereford, and all the movables whereof the king my brother was possessed. I'll claim that promise at your grace's hand. And look to have it yielded with all kindness. Come, let us sup betimes, that afterwards we may digest our complots in some form. Exeunt. Scene two, before Lord Hastings' house. Enter a messenger. My lord, my lord! Knocking. Within. Who knocks? One from the Lord Stanley. Within. What is it o'clock? Upon the stroke of four. Enter Hastings. Cannot my Lord Stanley sleep these tedious nights? So it appears, by that I have to say. First, he commends him to your noble self. What then? Then certifies your lordship that this night he dreamt the boar had raised off his helm. Besides, he says there are two counsels held, and that may be determined at the one which may make you and him to rue at the other. Therefore he sends to know your lordship's pleasure, if you will presently take horse with him, and with all speed post with him toward the north, to shun the danger that his soul divines. Go, fellow, go, return unto thy lord. Bid him not fear the separated counsels. His honour and myself are at the one and at the other is my good friend Catsby, where nothing can proceed that toucheth us, whereof I shall not have intelligence. Tell him his fears are shallow, without instance, and for his dreams I wonder he's so simple to trust the mockery of unquiet slumbers, to fly the boar before the boar pursues what incense the boar to follow us, and make pursuit where he did mean no chase. Go, bid thy master rise and come to me, and we will both together to the tower, where he shall see the boar will use us kindly. I'll go, my lord, and tell him what you say. Exit. Enter Catesby. Many good morrows to my noble lord. Good morrow, Catesby. You are early stirring. What news, what news in this our tottering state? 
"'It is a reeling world indeed, my lord, and, I believe, we'll never stand upright till Richard wear the garland of the realm.' "'How? Wear the garland? Dost thou mean the crown?' "'I, my good lord.' "'I'll have this crown of mine cut from my shoulders before I'll see the crown so foul misplaced. But canst thou guess that he doth aim at it?' "'Aye, on my life, and hopes to find you forward upon his party for the gain thereof.' And thereupon he sends you this good news, that this same very day your enemies, the kindred of the queen, must die at Pomfret. Indeed, I am no mourner for that news, because they have been still my adversaries. But that I'll give my voice on Richard's side to bar my master's heirs and true descent, God knows I will not do it to the death. God keep your lordship in that gracious mind. But I shall laugh at this a twelve-month hence, that they which brought me in my master's hate, I live to look upon their tragedy. Well, Catsby, ere a fortnight make me older, I'll send some packing that yet think not on it. Tis a vile thing to die, my gracious lord, when men are unprepared and look not for it. Oh, monstrous, monstrous, and so falls it out with rivers, Vaughan, Grey, and so twill do with some men else that think themselves as safe as thou and I, who, as thou knowest, are dear to princely Richard and to Buckingham. The princes both make high account of you. Aside for they count his head upon the bridge. I know they do, and I have well deserved it. Enter Stanley. Come on, come on. Where is your boar-spear, man? Fare you the boar, and go so unprovided? My lord, good morrow, and good morrow, Catesby. You may jest on, but by the holy rood I do not like these several counsels, I. My lord, I hold my life as dear as you do yours, and never in my days I do protest was it so precious to me as tis now— Think you but that I know our state secure, I would be so triumphant as I am? The lords at Pomfret, when they rode from London, were jocund, and supposed their states were sure, and they, indeed, had no cause to mistrust. But yet you see how soon the day o'er cast. This sudden stab of rancour I misdoubt. Pray God, I say, I prove a needless coward. What shall we toward the tower? The day is spent. Come, come, have with you. What you wot, my lord, uh, to-day the lords you talked of are beheaded. They, for their truth, might better wear their heads than some that have accused them wear their hats. But come, my lord, let's away. Enter a pursuivant. Go on, before. I'll talk with this good fellow. Exeunt Stanley and Catesby. How now, sirrah? How goes the world with thee? The better that your lordship please to ask. I tell thee, man, tis better with me now than when thou met'st me last when now we meet. Then I was going prisoner to the tower, by the suggestion of the Queen's allies. But now, I tell thee, keep it to thyself. This day those enemies are put to death, and I in better state than e'er I was. God hold it, to your honour's good content. Gramercy, fellow, uh, there, drink that for me. Throwing him his purse. Oh, I thank your honour. Exit. Enter a priest. Well met, my lord. I am glad to see your honour. I thank thee, good Sir John, with all my heart. I am in your debt for your last exercise. Uh, come the next Sabbath, and I will content you. Enter Buckingham. What, talking with the priest, Lord Chamberlain? Your friends at Pomfret, they do need the priest. Your honour hath no striving work in hand. Good faith, and when I met this holy man, the men you talk of came into my mind. What, you go toward the tower? I do, my lord, but long I cannot stay there. I shall return before your lordship thence. Uh, nay, like enough, for I stay dinner there. Aside. And supper, too, although thou know'st it not. Come, will you go? I'll wait upon your lordship. Exeunt. Scene three. Pomfret, before the castle. Enter Ratcliffe, with guard, conducting rivers, Grey, and Vaughan, to execution. Sir Richard Ratcliffe, let me tell thee this. Today shalt thou behold a subject die for truth, for duty, and for loyalty. God bless the prince from all the back of you, and not you are of damned bloodsuckers. You live that shall cry woe for this hereafter. Dispatch, the limit of your lives is out. O oh, Pomfret, Pomfret, O oh, thou bloody prison! Fatal and ominous to noble peers, Within the guilty closure of thy walls, Richard the Second here was hacked to death, And for more slander to thy dismal seat, 
we give to thee our guiltless blood to drink. Now Margaret's curse is fallen upon our heads. When she exclaimed on Hastings, you and I, for standing by when Richard stabbed her son. Then cursed she Richard, then cursed she Buckingham, then cursed she Hastings. Oh, remember God, to hear her prayer for them, as now for us. And for my sister and her princely sons, be satisfied, dear God, with our true blood, which, as thou knowest, unjustly must be spilt. Make haste, the hour of death is expired. Come, Grey, come, Vaughn, let us hear embrace. Farewell, until we meet again in heaven. Exeunt. Scene four, London, a room in the tower. Buckingham, Stanley, Hastings, the Bishop of Ely, Radcliffe, Lovell, and others sitting at a table, officers of the council attending. Now, noble peers, the cause why we are met is to determine of the coronation. In God's name speak, when is the royal day? Are all things ready for that royal time? They are, and wants but nomination. To-morrow, then, I judge a happy day. Who knows the Lord Protector's mind herein? Who is most inward with the noble duke? Your grace, we think, should soonest know his mind. We know each other's faces. For our hearts, he knows no more of mine than I of yours. Or I of his, my lord, than you of mine. Lord Hastings, you and he are near in love. I thank his grace. I know he loves me well. But for his purpose in the coronation I have not sounded him, nor he delivered his gracious pleasure any way therein. But you, my honourable lords, may name the time. And in the duke's behalf I'll give my voice, which I presume he'll take in gentle part. In happy time! Here comes the duke himself. Enter Gloucester. Oh, my noble lords and cousins, all good morrow. <laughs> I have been long a sleeper. But I trust my absence doth neglect no great design by which my presence might have been concluded. Had you not come upon your cue, my lord, William Lord Hastings had pronounced your part, I mean, your voice, for crowning of the king. Then, my lord Hastings, no man might be bolder. His lordship knows me well, and loves me well. My lord of Ely, when I was last in Hoburn, I saw good strawberries in your garden there. I do beseech you, send for some of them. Mary, and will, my lord, with all my heart. Exit. Cousin of Buckingham, a word with you. Takes him aside. Catesby hath sounded Hastings in our business, and finds the testy gentleman so hot that he will lose his head ere give consent his master's child, as worshipfully he terms it, shall lose the royalty of England's throne. Withdraw yourself a while. I'll go with you. Exeunt Gloucester and Buckingham. We have not yet set down this day of triumph. To-morrow, in my judgment, is too sudden, for I myself am not so well provided as else I would be were the day prolonged. Re-enter Bishop of Ely. Where is my lord the Duke of Gloucester? I have sent for these strawberries. His grace looks cheerfully and smooth this morning. There's some conceit or other likes him well when that he bids good morrow with such spirit. I think there's ne'er a man in Christendom can lesser hide his love or hate than he, for by his face straight shall you know his heart. What of his heart perceive you in his face by any livelihood he showed to-day? Marry that with no man here he is offended, for were he, he had shown it in his looks. Re-enter Gloucester and Buckingham. I pray you all, tell me what they deserve that do conspire my death with devilish plots of damned witchcraft, and that have prevailed upon my body with their hellish charms. The tender love I bear your grace, my lord, makes me most forward in this princely presence, to doom the offenders whosoe'er they be. I say, my lord, they have deserved death. Then be your eyes the witness of their evil. Look how I am bewitched! Behold, mine arm is like a blasted sapling withered up. And this is Edward's wife. That monstrous witch, consorted with that harlot strumpet sure, that by their witchcraft thus have marked me. If they have done this deed, my noble lord. If? 
Thou protector of this damned strumpet, talk'st thou to me of ifs? Thou art a traitor! Off with his head! Now! By St. Paul, I swear I will not dine until I see the same! Lovell and Ratcliffe, look that it be done! The rest that love me, rise and follow me! Exeunt all except Hastings, Lovell, and Ratcliffe. Woe, woe for England, not a whit for me, for I too fond might have prevented this. Stanley did dream the boar did raise his helm, and I did scorn it and disdain to fly. Three times to-day my footcloth horse did stumble, and started when he looked upon the tower, as loath to bear me to the slaughter-house. Oh, now I need the priest that spake to me, I now repent, I told the pursuivant, as too triumphing, how my enemies to-day at Pomfret bloodily were butchered and I myself secure in grace and favour. O oh, Margaret, Margaret, now thy heavy curse is lighted on poor Hastings' wretched head. Come, come, dispatch. The duke would be at dinner. Make a short shrift. He longs to see your head. O oh, momentary grace of mortal men, which we more hunt for than the grace of God, who builds his hope in air of your good looks, lives like a drunken sailor in a mast, ready with every nod to tumble down into the fatal bowels of the deep come come dispatch tis bootless to exclaim o oh, bloody richard miserable england i prophesy the fearfullest time to thee that ever wretched age hath looked upon come lead me to the block bear him my head they smile at me who shortly shall be dead exeunt scene five london the tower walls. Enter Gloucester and Buckingham in rusty armour, marvellous ill favoured. Come, cousin, canst thou quake and change thy colour, murder thy breath in middle of a word, and then begin again and stop again, as if thou wert distraught and mad with terror? Tut, I can counterfeit the deep tragedian, speak and look back and pry on every side tremble and start at wagging of a straw intending deep suspicion ghastly looks are at my service like enforced smiles and both are ready in their offices at any time to grace my stratagems but what is catesby gone he is and see he brings the mayor along enter the lord mayor and catesby lord mayor look to the drawbridge there hark a drum catesby oh look the walls Lord Mayor, the reason we have sent— Look back, defend thee, hear our enemies. God and our innocency defend and guard us. Oh, be patient. They are friends, Ratcliffe and Lovell. Enter Lovell and Ratcliffe with Hastings' head. Here is the head of that ignoble traitor, the dangerous and unsuspected Hastings. <sighs> oh, so dear I loved the man that I must weep. I took him for the plainest, harmless creature that breathed upon the earth a Christian, made him my book wherein my soul recorded the history of all her secret thoughts. So smooth he daubed his vice with show of virtue that his apparent open guilt omitted, I mean his conversation with Shaw's wife, he lived from all attainder of suspects. Well, well, he was the covertest sheltered traitor that ever lived. Would you imagine or almost believe, were it not that by great preservation we live to tell it you, that the subtle traitor this day had plotted in the council house to murder me and my good lord of Gloucester? Had he done so? What? Think you we are Turks or infidels? Or that we would against the form of law proceed thus rashly in the villain's death, but that the extreme peril of the case, the peace of England, and our person's safety enforced us to this execution? Now fair befall you. He deserved his death, and your good graces both have well proceeded to warn false traitors from the like attempts. I never looked for better at his hands after he once fell in with Mistress Shore. Yet had we not determined he should die until your lordship came to see his end, which now the loving haste of these our friends, something against our meanings, have prevented. Because, my lord, we would have had you heard the traitor speak, and timorously confess the manner and the purpose of his treasons, 
that you might well have signified the same unto the citizens who haply may misconstrue us in him and wail his death but my good lord your grace's word shall serve as well as i had seen and heard him speak and do not doubt right noble princes both but i'll acquaint our duteous citizens with all your just proceedings in this case and to that end we wished your lordship here to avoid the censures of the carping world but since you come too late of our intent yet witness what you hear we did intend and so my good lord mayor we bid farewell exit lord mayor go after after cousin buckingham the mayor towards guildhall hies him in all post there at your midst advantage of the time infer the bastardy of edward's children tell them how edward put to death a citizen only for saying he would make his son heir to the crown meaning indeed his house which by the sign thereof was termed so moreover urge his hateful luxury and bestial appetite in change of lust which stretched unto their servants daughters wives even where his raging eye or savage heart without control listed to make a prey nay for a need thus far come near my person tell them when that my mother went with child of that insatiate edward noble york my princely father then had wars in france and by true computation of the time found that the issue was not his begot which well appeared in his lineaments being nothing like the noble duke my father yet touch this sparingly as twere far off because my lord you know my mother lives uh, doubt not my lord i'll play the orator as if the golden fee for which i plead were for myself and so my lord adieu if you thrive well bring them to baynard's castle where you shall find me well accompanied with reverend fathers and well-learned bishops i go and towards three or four o'clock look for the news that the guild hall affords exit go lovell with all speed dr shaw go thou to catesby to friar penker bid them both meet me within this hour at baynard's castle exeunt lovell and catesby now will i in to take some privy order to draw the brats of clarence out of sight and to give order that no manner person have any time recourse unto the princes exit scene six london a street enter a scrivener here is the indictment of the good lord hastings which in a set hand fairly is engrossed that it may be to-day read o'er in paul's and mark how well the sequel hangs together eleven hours i have spent to write it over for yesternight by catesby was it sent me the precedent was full as long a doing and yet within these five hours hastings lived untainted unexamined free at liberty here's a good world the while who is so gross that cannot see this palpable device yet who so bold but says he sees it not bad is the world and all will come to naught when such ill dealing must be seen in thought exit scene seven london court of baynard's castle enter gloucester and buckingham meeting how now how now what say the citizens now by the holy mother of our lord the citizens of mum say not a word touched you the bastardy of edward's children i did with his contract with lady lucy and his contract by deputy in france the insatiate greediness of his desires and his enforcement of the city wives his tyranny for trifles his own bastardy as being got your father then in france and his resemblance being not like the duke withal i did infer your lineaments being the right idea of your father both in your form and nobleness of mind laid open all your victories in scotland your discipline in war wisdom in peace your bounty virtue fair humility indeed left nothing fitting for your purpose untouched or slightly handled in discourse and when mine oratory drew toward end 
i bid them that did love their country's good cry god save richard england's royal king and did they so no so god help me they spake not a word but like dumb statues or breathing stones stared each on other and looked deadly pale which when i saw i reprehended them and asked the mayor what meant this wilful silence his answer was the people were not used to be spoke to but by the recorder then he was urged to tell my tale again thus saith the duke thus hath the duke inferred but nothing spoke in warrant from himself when he had done some followers of mine own at lower end of the hall hurled up their caps and some ten voices cried god save king richard and thus i took the vantage of those few thanks gentle citizens and friends quoth i this general applause and cheerful shout argues your wisdoms and your love to richard and even here break off and came away what tongueless blocks were they would they not speak will not the mayor then and his brethren come the mayor is here at hand intend some fear be not you spoke with but by mighty suit and look you get a prayer-book in your hand and stand between two churchmen good my lord for on that ground i'll make a holy descant and be not easily won to our requests play the maid's part still answer nay and take it i go and if you plead as well for them as i can say nay to thee for myself no doubt we bring it to a happy issue go go up to the leads the lord mayor knocks exit gloucester enter the lord mayor aldermen and citizens welcome my lord i dance attendance here i think the duke will not be spoke with all enter from the castle catesby now catesby what says your lord to my request he doth entreat your grace my noble lord to visit him to-morrow or next day he is within with two right reverend fathers divinely bent to meditation and in no worldly suit would he be moved to draw him from his holy exercise return good catesby to the gracious duke tell him myself the mayor and alderman in deep designs in matter of great moment no less importing than our general good are come to have some conference with his grace i'll signify so much unto him straight exit aha my lord this prince is not an edward he is not lolling on a lewd day-bed but on his knees at meditation not dallying with a brace of courtesans but meditating with two deep divines not sleeping to engross his idle body but praying to enrich his watchful soul happy were england would this virtuous prince take on his grace the sovereignty thereof but sure i fear we shall not win him to it mary god defend his grace should say us nay i fear he will here catesby comes again re-enter catesby now catesby what says his grace he wonders to what end you have assembled such troops of citizens to come to him his grace not being warned thereof before he fears my lord you mean no good to him sorry i am my noble cousin should suspect me that i mean no good to him by heaven we come to him in perfect love and so once more return and tell his grace exit catesby when holy and devout religious men are at their beads tis much to draw them thence so sweet is zealous contemplation enter gloucester in a gallery above between two bishops catesby returns see where his grace stands tween two clergymen two props of virtue for a christian prince to stay him from the fall of vanity and see a book of prayer in his hand true ornaments to know a holy man famous plantagenet most gracious prince lend favourable ear to our requests and pardon us the interruption of thy devotion and right christian zeal my lord there needs no such apology i rather do beseech you pardon me who earnest in the service of my god deferred the visitation of my friends but leaving this what is your grace's pleasure even that i hope which pleaseth god above and all good men of this ungoverned isle 
I do suspect I have done some offence that seems disgracious in the city's eye, and that you come to reprehend my ignorance. You have, my lord. Would it might please your grace on our entreaties to amend your fault? Else wherefore breathe I in a Christian land? No, then, it is your fault that you resign the supreme seat, the throne majestical, the sceptred office of your ancestors, your state of fortune, and your due of birth the lineal glory of your royal house to the corruption of a blemished stock whilst in the mildness of your sleepy thoughts which here we waken to our country's good the noble isle doth want her proper limbs her face defaced with scars of infamy her royal stock graft with ignoble plants and almost shouldered in the swallowing gulf of dark forgetfulness and deep oblivion which to recure we heartily solicit your gracious self to take on you the charge and kingly government of this your land not as protector steward substitute or lowly factor for another's gain but as successively from blood to blood your right of birth your empery your own for this consorted with the citizens your very worshipful and loving friends, and by their vehement instigation in this just cause come I to move your grace. I cannot tell if to depart in silence, or bitterly to speak in your reproof, best fitteth my degree or your condition. If not to answer, you might happily think tongue-tied ambition, not replying, yielded to bear the golden yoke of sovereignty which fondly you would here impose on me. If to reprove you for this suit of yours, so seasoned with your faithful love to me, then on the other side I checked my friends. Therefore, to speak and to avoid the first, and then in speaking not to incur the last, Definitively thus I answer you. Your love deserves my thanks, but my desert unmeritable shuns your high request. First, if all obstacles were cut away, and that my path were even to the crown, as the ripe revenue and due of birth, yet so much is my poverty of spirit, so mighty and so many my defects that I would rather hide me from my greatness, being a bark to brook no mighty sea, than in my greatness covet to be hid, and in the vapour of my glory smothered. But, God be thanked, there is no need of me, and much I need to help you were there need. The royal tree hath left us royal fruit, which, mellowed by the stealing hours of time, will well become the seat of majesty and make no doubt us happy by his reign. On him I lay that you would lay on me, the right and fortune of his happy stars, which God defend that I should wring from him. My lord, this argues conscience in your grace, but the respects thereof are nice and trivial, all circumstances well considered. You say that Edward is your brother's son, so say we too, but not by Edward's wife, for first was he contract to Lady Lucy. Your mother lives a witness to his vow, and afterward by substitute betrothed to Bona, sister to the King of France. These are both put off, a poor petitioner, a care-crazed mother to a many sons, a beauty-waning and distressed widow, even in the afternoon of her best days, made prize and purchase of his wanton eye, seduced the pitch and height of his degree to base declension and loathed bigamy. By her, in his unlawful bed, he got this Edward, whom our manners call the prince. More bitterly could I expostulate, save that, for reverence to some alive, I give a sparing limit to my tongue. Then, good my lord, take to your royal self this proffered benefit of dignity. And if not to bless us and the land withal, yet to draw forth your noble ancestry from the corruption of abusing time unto a lineal true derived course. Do, good my lord, your citizens entreat you. 
Refuse not, mighty lord, this proffered love. Oh, make them joyful, grant their lawful suit. Alas, why would you heap those cares on me? I am unfit for state and majesty. I do beseech you, take it not amiss. I cannot, nor I will not yield to you. If you refuse it, as in love and zeal, loath to depose the child, your brother's son, as well we know your tenderness of heart, and gentle, kind, effeminate remorse, which we have noted in you to your kindred, and equally indeed to all estates, yet know where you accept our suit or no, your brother's son shall never reign our king, but we will plant some other in the throne, to the disgrace and downfall of your house, and in this resolution here we leave you. Come, citizens, we will entreat no more. Exeunt Buckingham, the mayor and citizens retiring. Call them again, sweet prince, accept their suit. If you deny them, all the land will rue it. Will you enforce me to a world of cares? <sighs> Call them again. Catesby goes to the mayor, etc., and then exit. I'm not made of stone, but penetrable to your kind entreaties, albeit against my conscience and my soul. Re-enter Buckingham, and Catesby, Mayor, etc., coming forward. Cousin of Buckingham, and sage grave men, since you will buckle fortune on my back, to bear her burden where I will or no, I must have patience to endure the load. But if black scandal or foul-faced reproach attend the sequel of your imposition, your mere enforcement shall acquittance me from all the impure blots and stains thereof. For God doth know, and you may partly see, how far I am from the desire of this. God bless your grace. We see it, and will say it. In saying so, you shall but say the truth. Then I salute you with this royal title. Long live King Richard, England's worthy king. Amen. Tomorrow may it please you to be crowned? <laughs> Even when you please, for you will have it so. To-morrow, then, we will attend your grace, and so most joyfully we take our leave. To the bishops. Come, let us to our holy work again. Farewell, my cousin, farewell, gentle friends. Exeunt. End of Act 3《Act IV of Richard III》by William Shakespeare。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Act IV》Scene 1 — London, before the Tower Enter, on one side, Queen Elizabeth, Duchess of York, and Marquis of Dorset. On the other, Anne Duchess of Gloucester, Leading Lady Margaret Plantagenet, Clarence's young daughter. Who meets us here? My niece Plantagenet, led in the hand of her kind aunt of Gloucester? Now for my life she's wandering to the tower, on pure heart's love to greet the tender princes. Daughter, well met. God give your graces both a happy and a joyful time of day. As much to you, good sister. Whither away? No farther than the tower and, as I guess, upon the like devotion as yourselves, to gratulate the gentle princes there. Kind sister, thanks. We'll enter all together. And in good time here the lieutenant comes. Enter Brackenbury. Master lieutenant, pray you, by your leave, how doth the prince and my young son of York? Right well, dear madam. Uh, by your patience I may not suffer you to visit them. The king hath strictly charged the contrary. The king? Who's that? I mean the Lord Protector. The Lord protect him from that kingly title. Hath he set bounds between their love and me? I am their mother. Who shall bar me from them? I am their father's mother. I will see them. Their aunt I am in law. In love their mother. Then bring me to their sights. I'll bear thy blame and take thy office from thee on my peril. No, madam, no. I may not leave it so. I am bound by oath, and therefore pardon me. Exit. Enter Stanley. 
Let me but meet you ladies one hour hence, and I'll salute your grace of York as mother and reverend looker-on of two fair queens. To the Duchess of Gloucester. Come, madam, you must straight to Westminster, there to be crowned Richard's royal queen. Oh, cut my lace asunder, that my pent heart may have some scope to beat, or else I swoon with this dead-killing news. Despiteful tidings! O oh, unpleasing news! Be of good cheer, mother. How fares your grace? O oh, Dorset, speak not to me. Get thee gone. Death and destruction dog thee at thy heels. Thy mother's name is ominous to children. If thou wilt outstrip death, go across the seas, and live with Richmond from the reach of hell. Go, hie thee, hie thee from this slaughter-house, lest thou increase the number of the dead, and make me die the thrall of Margaret's curse, nor mother, wife, nor England's counted queen. Full of wise care is this your counsel, madam. Take all the swift advantage of the hours. You shall have letters from me to my son, in your behalf, to meet you on the way. Be not ta'en tardy by unwise delay. O oh, ill-dispersing wind of misery! O oh, my accursed womb, the bed of death! A cockatrice hast thou hatched to the world, whose unavoided eye is murderous. Come, madam, come! I in all haste was sent. And I with all unwillingness will go. O oh, would to God that the inclusive verge of golden metal that must round my brow were red-hot steel to sear me to the brain! Anointed let me be with deadly venom, and die ere men can say, God save the Queen. Go, go, poor soul, I envy not thy glory. To feed my humour wish thyself no harm. No? Why? When he that is my husband now came to me, as I followed Henry's course, when scarce the blood was well washed from his hands which issued from my other angel husband, and that dear saint which then I weeping followed. Oh, when I say I looked on Richard's face, this was my wish. Be thou, quoth I, accursed for making me so young, so old a widow. And when thou wedst, let sorrow haunt thy bed, and be thy wife, if any be so mad, more miserable by the life of thee than thou hast made me by my dear lord's death. Lo! Ere I can repeat this curse again, within so small a time my woman's heart grossly grew captive to his honey words, and proved the subject of mine own soul's curse, which hitherto hath held my eyes from rest. For never yet one hour in his bed did I enjoy the golden dew of sleep, but with his timorous dreams was still awaked. Besides, he hates me for my father Warwick, and will no doubt shortly be rid of me. Oh, poor heart, adieu! I pity thy complaining. No more than with my soul I mourn for yours. Farewell, thou woeful welcomer of glory. Adieu, poor soul, that takes thy leave of it. To Dorset. Go thou to Richmond, and good fortune guide thee. To Anne. Go thou to Richard, and good angels tend thee. To Queen Elizabeth. Go thou to sanctuary, and good thoughts possess thee. I to my grave, where peace and rest lie with me. Eighty odd years of sorrow have I seen, and each hour's joy wrecked with a week of teen. Stay yet. Look back with me unto the tower. Pity, you ancient stones, those tender babes, whom envy hath immured within your walls. Rough cradle for such little pretty ones. Rude, ragged nurse, old, sullen playfellow for tender princes. Use my babies well. So foolish sorrows bids your stones farewell. Exeunt. Scene two. London. A room of state in the palace. Flourish of trumpets. Richard as king upon his throne. Buckingham, Catesby, Radcliffe, Lovell, a page, and others. Stand all apart. Cousin of Buckingham. My gracious sovereign, give me thy hand. Ascends the throne. Thus high, by thy advice and thy assistance, is King Richard seated. But shall we wear these glories for a day, or shall they last, and we rejoice in them? Still live they, and for ever let them last. Ah, Buckingham, 
now do i play the touch to try if thou be current gold indeed young edward lives think now what i would speak say on my loving lord why buckingham i say i would be king why so you are my thrice renowned lord ha huh? am i king tis so but edward lives true noble prince oh bitter consequence that edward still should live true noble prince cousin thou wast not wont to be so dull shall i be plain i wish the bastards dead and i would have it suddenly performed what sayest thou now speak suddenly be brief your grace may do your pleasure tut tut thou art all ice thy kindness freezes say have i thy consent that they shall die give me some little breath some pause dear lord before i positively speak in this i will resolve your grace immediately exit aside the king is angry see he gnaws his lip i will converse with iron-witted fools and unrespective boys descends from his throne none are for me that look into me with considerate eyes high-reaching buckingham grows circumspect boy my lord Knowst thou not any whom corrupting gold will tempt unto a close exploit of death? I know a discontented gentleman, whose humble means match not his haughty spirit. Gold were as good as twenty orators, and will, no doubt, tempt him to anything. What is his name? His name, my lord, is Tyrell. I partly know the man. Go, call him hither, boy. Exit page. The deep revolving witty Buckingham no more shall be the neighbour to my counsels. Hath he so long held out with me untired, and stops he now for breath? Well, be it so. Enter Stanley. How now, Lord Stanley, what's the news? No, my loving lord, the Marquis Dorset, as I hear, is fled to Richmond in the parts where he abides. Come hither, Catesbeer. Rumour it abroad that Anne, my wife, is very grievous sick. I will take order for her keeping close. Inquire me out some mean poor gentleman whom I will marry straight to Clarence's daughter. The boy is foolish, and I fear him not. Look how thou dream'st, I say again, give out that Anne, my queen, is sick and like to die. About it, for it stands me much upon to stop all hopes whose growth may damage me. Exit Catesby. I must be married to my brother's daughter, or else my kingdom stands on brittle glass. Murder her brothers, and then marry her. Uncertain way of gain, but I am in so far in blood that sin will pluck on sin. Tear-falling pity dwells not in this eye. Re-enter page with Tyrrell. Is thy name Tyrrell? James Tyrrell, in your most obedient subject. Art thou indeed? Prove me, my gracious lord. Darest thou resolve to kill a friend of mine? Please you, but I'd rather kill two enemies. Why, then thou hast it. Two deep enemies, foes to my rest and my sweet sleep's disturbers, are they that I would have thee deal upon. Terrell, I mean those bastards in the tower. Let me have open means to come to them and soon I'll rid you from the fear of them. Thou singest sweet music. Hark, come hither, Tyrrell. Go, by this token, rise, and lend thine ear. Whispers. There is no more but so. Say it is done, and I will love thee, and prefer thee for it. I will dispatch it straight. Exit. Re-enter Buckingham. My lord, I have considered in my mind the late request that you did sound me in. Well, let that rest. Dorset is fled to Richmond. I hear the news, my lord. Stanley, he is your wife's son. Well, look to it. My lord, I claim the gift, my due by promise, for which your honour and your faith is pawned. The earldom of Hereford and the movables which you have promised I shall possess. Stanley, look to your wife. If she convey letters to Richmond, you shall answer it. 
What says your highness to my just request? I do remember me. Henry the Sixth did prophesy that Richmond should be king, when Richmond was a little peevish boy. A king? Perhaps. My lord! How chance the prophet could not at that time have told me, I being by, that I should kill him? My lord, your promise for the earldom. Richmond, when last I was at Exeter, the mayor, in courtesy, showed me the castle, and called it Rougemont, at which name I started, because a bard of Ireland told me once I should not live long after I saw Richmond. My lord! Aye, what's o'clock? I am thus bold to put your grace in mind of what you promised me. Well, but what's o'clock? Upon the stroke of ten. Well, let it strike. Why let it strike? Because that like a jack thou keep'st the stroke Betwixt thy begging and my meditation. I am not in the giving vein to-day. Why then resolve me whether you will or no. Thou troublest me. I am not in the vein. Exeunt King Richard and Train. And is it thus? Repays he my deep service with such contempt? Made I him king for this? Oh, let me think on Hastings and be gone To Brecknock while my fearful head is on. Exit. Scene three. London. Another room in the palace. Enter Tyrrell. The tyrannous and bloody act is done. The most arch deed of piteous massacre that ever yet this land was guilty of. Dighton and Forrest, who I did suborn to do this piece of ruthless butchery, albeit they were fleshed villains, bloody dogs, melted with tenderness and mild compassion, wept like two children in their death's sad story. O oh, thus, quoth Dighton, lay the gentle babes. Thus, thus, quoth Forrest, girdling one another within their alabaster innocent arms. Their lips were four red roses on a stalk, and in their summer beauty kissed each other. A book of prayers on their pillow lay, which once, quoth Forrest, almost changed my mind. But, oh, the devil! There the villain stopped, when Dighton thus told on, We smothered the most replenished sweet work of nature that from the prime creation ever she framed. Hence both are gone, with conscience and remorse they could not speak. And so I left them both to bear this tidings to the bloody king. And here he comes. Enter King Richard. O oh, health, my sovereign lord. Kind Tyrrell, am I happy in thy news? If to have done the thing you gave in charge beget your happiness, be happy then, for it is done. But didst thou see them dead? I did, my lord. And buried, gentle Tyrrell? Uh, the chaplain of the tower hath buried them, but to where, to say the truth, I do not know. Come to me, Tyrrell, soon, at after supper, when thou shalt tell the process of their death. Meantime, but think how I may do thee good, and be inheritor of thy desire. Farewell till then. I humbly take my leave. Exit. The son of Clarence have I pent up close, his daughter meanly have I matched in marriage, the sons of Edward sleep in Abraham's bosom, and Anne my wife hath bid the world good night. Now, for I know the Breton Richmond aims at young Elizabeth, my brother's daughter, and by that knot looks proudly on the crown, to her go I a jolly, thriving wooer. Enter Ratcliffe. My lord. Good or bad news that comes in so bluntly? Bad news, my lord. Morton is fled to Richmond, and Buckingham, backed with a hardy Welshman, is in the field and still his power increaseth. Ely with Richmond troubles me more near than Buckingham and his rash-levied strength. Come, I have learned that fearful commenting is leaden servitor to dull delay. Delay leads impotent and snail-paced beggary. Then fiery expedition be my wing, Jove's Mercury, and herald for a king. Go, muster men, my counsel is my shield. We must be brief when traitors brave the field. Exeunt. Scene 4. London. Before the palace. 
Enter Queen Margaret. So now prosperity begins to mellow and drop into the rotten mouth of death. Here in these confines slyly have I lurked to watch the waning of mine enemies. A dire induction am I witness to and will to France, hoping the consequence will prove as bitter, black, and tragical. Withdraw thee, wretched Margaret, who comes here? Retires. Enter Queen Elizabeth and the Duchess of York. Oh, my poor princes! Ah, oh, my tender babes! My unblown flowers, new appearing sweets! If yet your gentle souls fly in the air and be not fixed in doom perpetual, hover about me with your airy wings, and hear your mother's lamentation. Hover about her. Say that right for right hath dimmed your infant morn to aged night. So many miseries have crazed my voice that my woe-wearied tongue is still and mute. Edward Plantagenet, why art thou dead? Plantagenet doth quit Plantagenet. Edward for Edward pays a dying debt. Wilt thou, O oh God, fly from such gentle lambs and throw them in the entrails of the wolf? When didst thou sleep when such a deed was done? When holy Harry died and my sweet son. Dead life, blind sight, poor mortal living ghost, woes seen, world shame, graves due by life usurped, brief abstract and record of tedious days, rest thy unrest on England's lawful earth, unlawfully made drunk with innocent blood. Sitting down. Ah, oh, that thou wouldst as soon afford a grave as thou canst yield a melancholy seat! Then would I hide my bones, not rest them here. Ah, who hath any cause to mourn but we? Sitting down by her, coming forward. If ancient sorrow be most reverent, give mine the benefit of scenery, and let my griefs frown on the upper hand. Sitting down with them. If sorrow can admit society, Tell o'er your woes again by viewing mine. I had an Edward till a Richard killed him. I had a Henry till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst an Edward till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst a Richard till a Richard killed him. I had a Richard too, and thou didst kill him. I had a Rutland too, thou hopst to kill him. Thou hadst a Clarence, too, and Richard killed him. From forth the kennel of thy womb hath crept a hell-hound that doth hunt us all to death. That dog that had his teeth before his eyes to worry lambs and lap their gentle blood, that foul defacer of God's handiwork, that excellent grand tyrant of the earth that reigns in gallid eyes of weeping souls, thy womb let loose to chase us to our graves. O upright, just, and true-disposing God, how do I thank thee that this carnal cur preys on the issue of his mother's body, and makes her pew-fellow with others moan? O oh, Harry's wife, triumph not in my woes. God witness with me, I have wept for thine. Bear with me. I am hungry for revenge, and now I cloy me with beholding it. Thy Edward, he is dead, that killed my Edward. The other Edward dead to quit my Edward. Young York, he is but boot, because both they match not the high perfection of my loss. Thy Clarence he is dead that stabbed my Edward, and the beholders of this frantic play, the adulterate Hastings, Rivers, Vaughan, Grey, untimely smothered in their dusky graves. Richard yet lives, hell's black intelligence, only reserve their factor to buy souls and send them thither. 
but at hand at hand ensues his piteous and unpitied end earth gapes hell burns fiends roar saints pray to have him suddenly conveyed from hence cancel his bond of life dear god i pray that i may live to say the dog is dead though thou didst prophesy the time would come that i should wish for thee to help me curse that bottled spider that foul bunch-backed toad i called thee then vain flourish of my fortune i called thee then poor shadow painted queen the presentation of but what i was the flattering index of a direful pageant one heaved high to be hurled down below a mother only mocked with two fair babes a dream of what thou wast a garish flag to be the aim of every dangerous shot a sign of dignity a breath a bubble a queen in jest only to fill the scene where is thy husband now where be thy brothers where be thy two sons wherein dost thou joy who sues and kneels and says god save the queen where be the bending peers that flattered thee where be the thronging troops that followed thee decline all this and see what now thou art for happy wife a most distressed widow for joyful mother one that wails the name for one being sued to one that humbly sues for queen a very caitiff crowned with care for she that scorned at me now scorned of me for she being feared of all now fearing one for she commanding all obeyed of none thus hath the course of justice wheeled about and left thee but a very prey to time having no more but thought of what thou wast to torture thee the more being what thou art thou didst usurp my place and dost thou not usurp the just proportion of my sorrow now thy proud neck bears half my burdened yoke from which even here i slip my weary head and leave the burden of it all on thee farewell york's wife and queen of sad mischance these english woes shall make me smile in france oh thou well skilled in curses stay a while and teach me how to curse mine enemies forbear to sleep the night and fast the day compare dead happiness with living woe think that thy babes were sweeter than they were and he that slew them fouler than he is bettering thy loss makes the bad cause a worse revolving this will teach thee how to curse my words are dull oh quicken them with thine thy woes will make them sharp and pierce like mine exit why should calamity be full of words windy attorneys to their client woes airy succeeders of intestate joys poor breathing orators of miseries let them have scope though what they do in part help nothing else yet do they ease the heart if so then be not tongue-tied go with me and in the breath of bitter words let smother my damned son that thy two sweet sons smothered drum within i hear his drum be copious and exclaims enter king richard and his train marching who intercepts me in my expedition o oh, she that might have intercepted thee by strangling thee in her accursed womb from all the slaughters wretch that thou hast done hidest thou that forehead with a golden crown where should be branded if that right were right the slaughter of the prince that owed that crown and the dire death of my poor sons and brothers 
tell me, thou villain slave, where are my children? Thou toad, thou toad, where is thy brother Clarence, and little Ned Plantagenet his son? Where is the gentle rivers, Vaughan, Grey? Where is kind Hastings? A flourish, trumpets, strike alarum, drums. Let not the heavens hear these tell-tale women rail on the Lord's anointed. Strike, I say. Flourish, alarums. Either be patient and entreat me fair, or with the clamorous report of war, thus will I drown your exclamations. Art thou my son? I, I thank God, my father, and yourself. Then patiently hear my impatience. Madam, I have a touch of your condition that cannot brook the accent of reproof. Oh, let me speak. Do then, but I'll not hear. I will be mild and gentle in my words. And brief, good mother, for I am in haste. Art thou so hasty? I have stayed for thee, God knows, in torment and in agony. And came I not at last to comfort you? No, by the holy rood, thou know'st it well. Thou camest on earth to make the earth my hell. A grievous burden was thy birth to me, tetchy and wayward was thy infancy, thy school-days frightful, desperate, wild, and furious, thy prime of manhood daring, bold, and venturous, thy age confirmed, proud, subtle, sly, and bloody, more mild, but yet more harmful, kind in hatred. What comfortable hour canst thou name that ever graced me with thy company? Faith none but Humphrey hour that called your grace to breakfast once forth of my company. If I be so disgracious in your eye, let me march on and not offend you, madam. Strike up the drum. I prithee hear me speak. You speak too bitterly. Hear me a word, for I shall never speak to thee again. So. Either thou wilt die by God's just ordinance, ere from this war thou turn a conqueror, or I, with grief and extreme age, shall perish, and never more behold thy face again. Therefore take with thee my most grievous curse, which in the day of battle tire thee more than all the complete armour that thou wearest. My prayers on the adverse party fight, and there the little souls of Edward's children whisper the spirits of thine enemies, and promise them success and victory. Bloody thou art, bloody will be thy end. Shame serves thy life, and doth thy death attend. Exit. Though far more cause, yet much less spirit to curse abides in me. I say amen to her. Going. Uh, stay, madam. I must talk a word with you. I have no more sons of the royal blood for thee to slaughter. For my daughters, Richard, they shall be praying nuns, not weeping queens, and therefore level not to hit their lives. You have a daughter called Elizabeth, virtuous and fair, royal and gracious. And must she die for this? Oh, let her live, and I'll corrupt her manners, stain her beauty, slander myself as false to Edward's bed, throw over her the veil of infamy, so she may live unscarred of bleeding slaughter. I will confess she was not Edward's daughter. Wrong not her birth. She is of royal blood. To save her life, I'll say she is not so. Her life is safest only in her birth. And only in that safety died her brothers. Lo, at their births good stars were opposite. No, to their lives bad friends were contrary. All unavoided is the doom of destiny. Oh, true, when avoided grace makes destiny. My babes were destined to a fairer death if grace had blessed thee with a fairer life. You speak as if that I had slain my cousins. Cousins, indeed, and by their uncle cousined of comfort, kingdom, kindred, freedom, life, whose hand soever lanced their tender hearts, thy head all indirectly gave direction. No doubt the murderous knife was dull and blunt till it was wetted on thy stone-hard heart to revel in the entrails of my lambs. But that still use of grief makes wild grief tame. My tongue should to thy ears not name my boys till that my nails were anchored in thine eyes. And I in such a desperate bay of death, like a poor bark of sails and tackling reft, rush all to pieces on thy rocky bosom. Madam, so thrive I in my enterprise and dangerous success of bloody wars, as I intend more good to you and yours than ever you or yours by me were harmed. What 
good is covered with the face of heaven to be discovered that can do me good. Advancement of your children, gentle lady. Up to some scaffold there to lose their heads. Unto the dignity and height of honour, the high imperial type of this earth's glory. Flatter my sorrows with the port of it. Tell me, what state, what dignity, what honour canst thou demise to any child of mine? Even all I have. I and myself and all will I with all endow a child of thine. So in the lethe of thy angry soul thou drown the sad remembrance of those wrongs which thou supposest I have done to thee. Be brief, lest that the process of thy kindness last longer telling than thy kindness date. Then know that from my soul I love thy daughter. Oh, my daughter's mother thinks it with her soul. What do you think? That thou dost love my daughter from thy soul. So from thy soul's love didst thou love her brother's, and from my heart's love I do thank thee for it. Be not so hasty to confound my meaning. I mean that with my soul I love thy daughter, and do intend to make her Queen of England. Oh, well, then, who dost thou mean shall be her king? Even he that makes her queen, who else should be? What? Thou? I, even I. What think you of it, madam? How canst thou woo her? Ah, that would I learn of you, as one being best acquainted with her humour. And wilt thou learn of me? Madam, with all my heart. Send to her, by the man that slew her brothers, a pair of bleeding hearts, thereon engrave Edward and York. Then haply will she weep. Therefore present to her, as sometimes Margaret did to thy father steeped in Rutland's blood, a handkerchief, which, say to her, did drain the purple sap from her sweet brother's bodies, and bid her wipe her weeping eyes withal. If this inducement move her not to love, send her a letter of thy noble deeds. Tell her thou mayst away her uncle Clarence, her uncle Rivers. Ay, and for her sake mayst quick conveyance with her good aunt Anne. You mock me, madam. This is not the way to win your daughter. There is no other way, unless thou couldst put on some other shape, and not be Richard that hath done all this. Say that I did all this. For love of her. Nay, then indeed she cannot choose but hate thee, having bought love with such a bloody spoil. Look, what is done cannot be now amended. Men shall deal unadvisedly sometimes, which after hours gives leisure to repent. If I did take the kingdom from your sons, to make amends, I'll give it to your daughter. If I have killed the issue of your womb, to quicken your increase, I will beget mine issue of your blood upon your daughter. A grandam's name is little less in love than is the doting title of a mother. They are as children but one step below, even of your metal, of your very blood, of all one pain, save for a night of groans endured of her for whom you bid like sorrow. Your children were vexation to your youth, but mine shall be a comfort to your age. The loss you have is but a son being king, and by that loss your daughter is made queen. I cannot make you what amends I would, therefore accept such kindness as I can. Dorset, your son, that with a fearful soul leads discontented steps in foreign soil, this fair alliance quickly shall call home to high promotions and great dignity. The king, that calls your beauteous daughter wife, familiarly shall call thy Dorset brother. Again you shall be mother to a king, and all the ruins of distressful times repaired with double riches of content. What, we have many goodly days to see. The liquid drops of tears that you have shed shall come again transformed to orient pearl, advantaging their loan with interest of ten times double gain of happiness. Go then, my mother, to thy daughter go. Make bold her bashful years with your experience. Prepare her ears to hear a wooer's tale. Put in her tender heart the aspiring flame of golden sovereignty, Acquaint the princess with these sweet silent hours of marriage joys. 
and when this arm of mine hath chastised the petty rebel dull-brained buckingham bound with triumphant garlands will i come and lead thy daughter to a conqueror's bed to whom i will retail my conquest won and she shall be sole victoress caesar's caesar what were i best to say her father's brother would be her lord or shall i say her uncle or he that slew her brothers and her uncles under what title shall i woo for thee that god the law my honour and her love can make seem pleasing to her tender years infer fair england's peace by this alliance which she shall purchase with still lasting war tell her the king that may command entreats that at her hands which the king's king forbids say she shall be a high and mighty queen to wail the title as her mother doth say i will love her everlastingly but how long shall that title ever last sweetly enforce unto her fair life's end but how long fairly shall her sweet life last as long as heaven and nature lengthens it as long as hell and richard likes of it say i her sovereign am her subject low but she your subject loathes such sovereignty be eloquent in my behalf to her an honest tale speeds best being plainly told then plainly to her tell my loving tale plain and not honest is too harsh a style your reasons are too shallow and too quick oh no my reasons are too deep and dead too deep and dead poor infants in their graves harp not on that string madam that is past harp on it still shall i till heart-strings break now by my george my garter and my crown profaned dishonoured and the third usurped i swear by nothing for this is no oath thy george profaned hath lost his lordly honour thy garter blemished pawned his knightly virtue thy crown usurped disgraced his kingly glory if something thou wouldst swear to be believed swear then by something that thou hast not wronged now by the world tis full of thy foul wrongs my father's death thy life hath that dishonoured then by myself thyself is self misused why then by god god's wrong is most of all if thou hadst feared to break an oath by him the unity the king thy brother made had not been broken nor my brother slain if thou hadst feared to break an oath by him the imperial metal circling now thy head had graced the tender temples of my child and both the princes had been breathing here which now to tender bedfellows for dust thy broken faith had made a prey for worms what canst thou swear by now the time to come that thou hast wronged in the time or past for i myself have many tears to wash hereafter time for time past wronged by thee the children live whose fathers thou hast slaughtered ungoverned youth to wail it in their age the parents live whose children thou hast butchered old barren plants to wail it with their age swear not by time to come for that thou hast misused ere used by times ill used or past as i intend to prosper and repent so thrive i in my dangerous attempt of hostile arms myself myself confound heaven and fortune bar me happy hours day yield me not thy light nor night thy rest be opposite all planets of good luck to my proceeding if with pure heart's love immaculate devotion holy thoughts i tender not thy beauteous princely daughter in her consists my happiness and thine without her follows to thyself and thee herself the land and many a christian soul death desolation ruin and decay it cannot be avoided but by this it will not be avoided but by this therefore dear mother i must call you so be the attorney of my love to her plead what i will be not what i have been not my deserts but what i will deserve urge the necessity and state of times and be not peevish found in great designs shall i be tempted of the devil thus I if the devil tempt you to do good shall i forget myself to be myself i if yourself's remembrance wrong yourself <laughs> yet thou didst kill my children but in your daughter's womb i bury them where 
in that nest of spicery they shall breed selves of themselves to your recomforture shall i go win my daughter to thy will and be a happy mother by the deed i go write to me very shortly and you shall understand from me her mind bear her my true love's kiss and so farewell kissing her exit queen elizabeth <laughs> relenting fool and shallow changing woman enter ratcliffe catesby following how now what news most mighty sovereign on the western coast rideth a puissant navy to the shore throng many doubtful hollow-hearted friends unarmed and unresolved to be them back Tis thought that Richmond is their admiral, and there they hull, expecting but the aid of Buckingham to welcome them ashore. Some lightfoot friend post to the Duke of Norfolk, Ratcliffe thyself, or Catesby, where is he? Here, my good lord. Catesby, fly to the Duke. I will, my lord, with all convenient haste. Ratcliffe, come hither, post to Salisbury. When thou comest thither... To Catesby. Thou unmindful villain, why stayst thou here and goest not to the Duke? First, mighty liege. Tell me, your highness' pleasure, what from your grace I shall deliver to him. Oh, true, good Catesby. Bid him levy straight the greatest strength and power that he can make, and meet me suddenly at Salisbury. I go. Exit. What, may it please you, shall I do at Salisbury? Why, what wouldst thou do there before I go? Your highness told me I should post before. Enter Stanley. My mind is changed. Stanley, what news with you? None good, my liege, to please you with the hearing. But none so bad, but well may be reported. Hoy day, a riddle, neither good nor bad. What needst thou run so many miles about when thou mayst tell thy tale the nearest way? Once more, what news? Richmond is on the seas. There let him sink and be the seas on him. White-livered runagate, what doth he there? I know not, mighty sovereign, but by guess. Well, as you guess. Stirred up by Dorset, Buckingham, and Morton, he makes for England here to claim the crown. Is the chair empty? Is the sword unswayed? Is the king dead? The empire unpossessed? What heir of York is there alive but we? And who is England's king but great York's heir? Then tell me, what makes he upon the seas? Unless for that, my liege, I cannot guess. Unless for that he comes to be your liege, you cannot guess wherefore the Welshman comes. Thou wilt revolt and fly to him, I fear. No, mighty liege, therefore mistrust me not. Where is thy power, then, to beat him back? Where be thy tenants and thy followers? Are they not now upon the western shore, safe conducting the rebels from their ships? No, my good lord, my friends are in the north. Cold friends to me? What do they in the north when they should serve their sovereign in the west? They have not been commanded, mighty king. Pleaseth your majesty to give me leave, I'll muster up my friends, and meet your grace where and what time your majesty shall please. Ay, ay, thou wouldst be gone to join with Richmond, but I'll not trust thee. Most mighty sovereign, you have no cause to hold my friendship doubtful. I never was, nor never will be false. Go then, and muster men, but leave behind your son. George Stanley, look your heart be firm, or else his head's assurance is but frail. So deal with him as I prove true to you. Exit. Enter a messenger. My gracious sovereign, now in Devonshire, as I by friends am well advertised, Sir Edward Courtney and the haughty prelate, Bishop of Exeter, his elder brother, with many more confederates, are in arms. Enter a second messenger. In Kent, my liege, the Guilfords are in arms, and every hour more competitors flock to the rebels, and their power grows strong. Enter a third messenger. My lord, the army of great Buckingham. Out on you, owls! Nothing but songs of death! He strikes him. There, take thou that till thou bring better news. The news I have to tell your majesty is that by sudden floods and fall of waters, Buckingham's army is dispersed and scattered, and he himself wandered away alone, no man knows whither. I cry you mercy. There is my purse to cure that blow of thine. Have any well-advised friend proclaimed reward to him that brings the traitor in? 
Such proclamation has been made, my liege. Enter a fourth messenger. Sir Thomas Lovell and Lord Marquis Dorset, tis said, my liege, in Yorkshire are in arms. But this good comfort bring I to your highness. The Britain navy is dispersed by tempest. Richmond, in Dorsetshire, sent out a boat unto the shore to ask those on the banks if they were his assistants, yea or no, who answered him they came from Buckingham upon his party. He, mistrusting them, hoist sail and made his course again for Britain. March on, march on, since we are up in arms, if not to fight with foreign enemies, yet to beat down these rebels here at home. Re-enter Catesby. My liege, the Duke of Buckingham is taken. That's the best news, that the Earl of Richmond is with a mighty power landed at Milford. It is colder tidings, yet they must be told. Away towards Salisbury. While we reason here, a royal battle might be won and lost. Some one take order Buckingham be brought to Salisbury, the rest march on with me. Flourish. Exeunt. Scene 5. A room in Lord Stanley's house. Enter Stanley and Sir Christopher Earlswick. Sir Christopher, tell Richmond this from me, that in the sty of the most deadly boar my son George Stanley is franked up in hold. If I revolt, off goes young George's head. The fear of that holds off my present aid. So get thee gone, commend me to thy lord. With all say that the Queen hath heartily consented he should espouse Elizabeth her daughter. But tell me, where is princely Richmond now? At Pembroke or at Harford West in Wales. What men of name resort to him? Sir Walter Herbert, a renowned soldier, Sir Gilbert Talbot, Sir William Stanley, Oxford, redoubted Pembroke Sir James Blunt, and Rice Ap Thomas, with a valiant crew, and many other of great name and worth. And toward London do they bend their power, if by the way they be not fought withal. Well, hide thee to thy lord. I kiss his hand. My letter will resolve him of my mind. Farewell. Gives papers to Sir Christopher. Exeunt. End of Act 4 Act 5 of Richard III by William Shakespeare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 5, Scene 1. Salisbury, an open place. Enter the sheriff and guard with Buckingham, led to execution. Will not King Richard let me speak with him? No, my good lord. Therefore be patient. Hastings, and Edward's children, Grey and Rivers, Holy King Henry and thy fair son Edward, Vaughan, and all that have miscarried by underhand corrupted foul injustice, if that your moody discontented souls do through the clouds behold this present hour, even for revenge, mock my destruction. This is All Souls Day, fellow, is it not? It is, my lord. Why, then, All Souls Day is my body's doomsday. This is the day which in King Edward's time I wished might fall on me when I was found false to his children and his wife's allies. This is the day wherein I wished to fall by the false faith of him whom I most trusted. This, this all soul's day to my fearful soul is the determined respite of my wrongs. That high all-seer which I dallied with hath turned my feigned prayer on my head and given in earnest what I begged in jest. Thus doth he force the swords of wicked men to turn their own points in their master's bosoms. Thus Margaret's curse falls heavy on my neck. When he, quoth she, shall split thy heart with sorrow, remember Margaret was a prophetess. Come lead me, officers, to the block of shame. Wrong hath but wrong, and blame. The due of blame. Exeunt. Scene two. Plain near Tamworth. Enter with Drummond colours, Richmond, Oxford, Sir James Blunt, Sir Walter Herbert, and others, with forces marching. Fellows in arms, and my most loving friends, bruised underneath the yoke of tyranny, 
Thus far into the bowels of the land have we marched on without impediment, and here receive we from our father Stanley lines of fair comfort and encouragement. The wretched, bloody, and usurping boar that spoiled your summer fields and fruitful vines, swills your warm blood like wash, and makes his trough in your embowelled bosoms, this foul swine lies now even in the centre of this isle, near to the town of Leicester, as we learn. From Tamworth thither is but one day's march. In God's name cheerly on, courageous friends, to reap the harvest of perpetual peace by this one bloody trial of sharp war. Every man's conscience is a thousand swords to fight against that bloody homicide. I doubt not, but his friends will turn to us. He hath no friends but what are friends for fear, which, in his dearest need, will fly from him. All for our vantage, then in God's name march. True hope is swift, and flies with swallows' wings. Kings it makes gods, and meaner creatures kings. Exeunt Scene 3. Bosworth Field Enter King Richard and forces. The Duke of Norfolk the Earl of Surrey, and others. Here pitch our tents, even here in Bosworth Field. My Lord of Surrey, why look you so sad? My heart is ten times lighter than my looks. My Lord of Norfolk. Here, most gracious liege. Norfolk, we must have knocks, eh? Must we not? We must both give and take, my loving lord. Up with my tent. Here will I lie to-night. Soldiers begin to set up the king's tent. But where to-morrow? Well, all's one for that. Who hath described the number of the traitors? Six or seven thousand is their utmost power. Why, our battalia trebles that account. Besides, the king's name is a tower of strength which they, upon the adverse faction, want. Up with the tent. Come, noble gentlemen, let us survey the vantage of the ground. Call for some men of sound direction. Let's lack no discipline, make no delay, for the lords, to-morrow is a busy day. Exeunt. Enter on the other side of the field. Richmond, Sir William Brandon, Oxford, and other lords. Some of the soldiers pitch Richmond's tent. The weary sun hath made a golden set, and by the bright tract of his fiery car gives token of a goodly day to-morrow. Sir William Brandon, you shall bear my standard. Give me some ink and paper in my tent. I'll draw the form and model of our battle, limit each leader to his several charge, and part in just proportion our small power. My Lord of Oxford, you, Sir William Brandon, and you, Sir Walter Herbert, stay with me. The Earl of Pembroke keeps his regiment. Good Captain Blunt, bear my good night to him, and by the second hour in the morning desire the Earl to see me in my tent. Yet one thing more, good Captain, do for me. Where is Lord Stanley quartered, do you know? Unless I have misstained his colours much, which well I am assured I have not done, his regiment lies half a mile at least, south from the mighty power of the king. If without peril it be possible, sweet Blunt, make some good means to speak with him, and give him from me this most needful note. Upon my life, my lord, I'll undertake it. And so, God give you quiet rest to-night. Good night, good Captain Blunt. Come, gentlemen, let us consult upon to-morrow's business. Into my tent. The air is raw and cold. David draw into the tent. Enter to his tent King Richard, Norfolk, Ratcliffe, and Catesby. What is the clock? It's supper time, my lord. It's six o'clock. I will not sup to-night. Give me some ink and paper. What? Is my beaver easier than it was, and all my arbor laid into my tent? It is, my liege, and all things are in readiness. Good Norfolk, hie thee to thy charge. Use careful watch. Choose trusty sentinels. I go, my lord. Stir with the lark to-morrow, gentle Norfolk. I warrant you, my lord. Exit. Ratcliffe. My lord. Send out a pursuivant at arms to Stanley's regiment. Bid him bring his power before sunrising, lest his son George fall into the blind cave of eternal night. Fill me a bowl of wine. Give me a watch. Saddle white Surrey for the field to-morrow. Look that my staves be sound and not too heavy. Ratcliffe. My lord. Sawest thou the melancholy Lord Northumberland? Thomas of Earl of Surrey and himself, much about cockshot time, from troop to troop, went through the army, cheering up the soldiers. So I am satisfied. 
Give me a bowl of wine. I have not that alacrity of spirit nor cheer of mind that I was wont to have. Set it down. Is ink and paper ready? It is, my lord. Bid my guard watch. Leave me. Ratcliffe, about the mid of night, come to my tent and help to arm me. Leave me, I say. King Richard retires into his tent. Exeunt Ratcliffe and Catesby. Richmond's tent opens, and discovers him and his officers, etc. Fortune and victory sit on thy helm. All comfort that the dark night can afford be to thy person, noble father-in-law. Tell me, how fares our loving mother? I, by attorney, bless thee from thy mother, who prays continually for Richmond's good. So much for that. The silent hours steal on, and flaky darkness breaks within the east. In brief, for so the season bids us be, prepare thy battle early in the morning, and put thy fortune to the arbitrament of bloody strokes and mortal staring war. I, as I may, that which I would I cannot. With best advantage will deceive the time, and aid thee in this doubtful stroke of arms. But on thy side I may not be too forward, lest, being seen, thy brother, tender George, be executed in his father's sight. Farewell, the leisure and the fearful time cuts off the ceremonious vows of love, an ample interchange of sweet discourse which so long-sundered friends should dwell upon. God give us leisure for these rites of love. Once more, adieu, be valiant, and speed well. Good lords, conduct him to his regiment. I'll strive with troubled thoughts to take a nap, lest leaden slumber pies me down to-morrow when I should mount with wings of victory. Once more, good night, kind lords and gentlemen. Exeunt lords, etc., with Stanley. O thou whose captain I account myself, look on my forces with a gracious eye. Put in their hands thy bruising irons of wrath, that they may crush down with a heavy fall the usurping helmets of our adversaries. Make us thy ministers of chastisement, that we may praise thee in thy victory. To thee I do commend my watchful soul, ere I let fall the windows of mine eyes. Sleeping and waking, oh, defend me still. Sleeps. The ghost of Prince Edward, son to Henry the Sixth, rises between the two tents. To King Richard. Let me sit heavy on thy soul to-morrow. Think how thou stabst me in my prime of youth. At Tewkesbury, despair therefore and die. To Richmond. Be cheerful, Richmond, for the wronged souls of butchered princes fight in thy behalf. King Henry's issue, Richmond, comforts thee. The ghost of Henry the Sixth rises. To King Richard. When I was mortal, my anointed body by thee was punched full of deadly holes. Think on the tower and me. Despair and die. Harry the Sixth bids thee despair and die. To Richmond. Virtuous and holy be thou, conqueror. Harry, the prophecy thou shouldst be king doth comfort thee in thy sleep. Live and flourish. The ghost of Clarence rises. To King Richard. Let me sit heavy in thy soul to-morrow. I that was washed to death with fulsome wine, poor Clarence, by thy guile betrayed to death. To-morrow in the battle think on me, and fall thy edgeless sword. Despair and die. To Richmond. Thou, offspring of the house of Lancaster, the wronged heirs of York do pray for thee. Good angels guard thy battle. Live and flourish. The ghosts of rivers, grey and worn, rise. To King Richard. Let me sit heavy in thy soul to-morrow. Rivers that died at Pomfret. Despair and die. Think upon grey and let thy soul despair think upon vaughn and with guilty fear let fall thy lance despair and die to richmond awake and, and think our wrongs, wrongs in richard's bosom, bosom. we we'll conquer, conquer him, him. awake and, and win the day the ghost of hastings rises to king richard bloody and guilty guiltily awake 
and in a bloody battle end thy days. Think on Lord Hastings, despair and die. To Richmond. Quiet, untroubled so. Awake, awake, arm, fight, and conquer for fair England's sake. The ghosts of the two young princes rise. To King Richard. Dream on thy cousins smothered in the tower. Let us be led within thy bosom, Richard, and weigh thee down to ruin, shame, and death. Thy nephew's souls bid thee despair and die. To Richmond. Sleep, Richmond, sleep in peace and wake in joy. Good angels guard thee from the boar's annoy. Live and beget a happy race of kings. Edward's unhappy sons do bid thee flourish. The Ghost of Queen Anne rises. To King Richard. Richard, thy wife, that wretched Anne, thy wife, that never slept a quiet hour with thee, now fills thy sleep with perturbations. To-morrow in the battle think on me, and for thy edgeless sword, despair and die. To Richmond. Thou quiet soul, sleep thou a quiet sleep. Dream of success and happy victory. Thy adversary's wife doth pray for thee. The ghost of Buckingham rises. To King Richard. The first was I that helped thee to the crown. The last was I that felt thy tyranny. Oh, in the battle think on Buckingham and die in terror of thy guiltiness. Dream on, dream on of bloody deeds and death. Fainting despair, despairing yield thy breath. To Richmond. I died for hope ere I could send thee aid. But cheer thy heart, and be thou not dismayed. God and good angels fight on Richmond's side, and Richard falls in height of all his pride. The ghosts vanish. King Richard starts out of his dream. Give me another horse. Bind up my wounds. Have mercy, Jesu. <gasps> Soft. <sighs> I did but dream. O oh, coward conscience, how dost thou afflict me? The lights burn blue. It is now dead midnight. Cold, fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. What? Do I fear myself? There is none else by. Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. Is there a murderer here? No. Yes. I am. Then fly. What? From myself? Great reason why. Lest I revenge. What? Myself upon myself? Alack, I love myself. Wherefore? For any good that I myself have done unto myself? Oh, no, alas, I rather hate myself for hateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain, yet I lie, I am not. Fool, of thyself speak well. Fool, do not flatter. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. Perjury, perjury in the highest degree, murder, stern murder in the direst degree, all several sins, all used in each degree, throng to the bar, crying all guilty, guilty. I shall despair. There is no creature loves me, and if I die... No soul will pity me, and wherefore should they, since that I myself find in myself no pity to myself? Methought the souls of all that I had murdered came to my tent, and every one did threat to-morrow's vengeance on the head of Richard. Enter Ratcliffe. My lord. Who's there? Ratcliffe, my lord, tis I. The early village cock hath twice done salutation to the morn. Your friends are up, and buckle on their armour. Oh, Radcliffe, I have dreamed a fearful dream. What thinkst thou? Will our friends prove all true? No doubt, my lord. Oh, Radcliffe, I fear, I fear. Nay, good my lord, be not afraid of shadows. <laughs> By the Apostle Paul, shadows to-night have struck more terror to the soul of richard than can the substance of ten thousand soldiers armoured in proof and led by shallow richmond it is not yet near day come go with me 
Under our tents I'll play the eavesdropper to see if any mean to shrink from me. Exeunt King Richard and Ratcliffe. Richmond wakes. Enter Oxford and others. Good morrow, Richmond. Cry mercy, lords and watchful gentlemen, that you have taken a tardy sluggard here. How have you slept, my lord? The sweetest sleep and fairest boating dreams that ever entered in a drowsy head have I since your departure had, my lords. Methought their souls whose bodies Richard murdered came to my tent and cried on victory. I promise you, my heart is very jocund in the remembrance of so fair a dream. How far into the morning is it, lords? Upon the stroke of four. Why, then tis time to arm and give direction. He advances to the troops. More than I have said, loving countrymen, the leisure and enforcement of the time forbids to dwell on. Yet remember this. God and our good cause fight upon our side. The prayers of holy saints and wronged souls, like high-reared bulwarks, stand before our faces. Richard except, those whom we fight against had rather have us win than him they follow. But what is he they follow? Truly, gentlemen, a bloody tyrant and a homicide. One raised in blood, and one in blood established. One that made means to come by what he hath, and slaughtered those that were the means to help him. A base foul stone, made precious by the foil of England's chair, where he is falsely set. One that hath ever been God's enemy. Then, if you fight against God's enemy, God will, in justice, ward you as his soldiers. If you do sweat to put a tyrant down, you sleep in peace, the tyrant being slain. If you do fight against your country's foes, your country's fat shall pay your pains the higher. If you do fight in safeguard of your wives, your wives shall welcome home the conquerors. If you do free your children from the sword, your children's children quit it in your age. Then, in the name of God and all these rites, advance your standards, draw your willing swords. For me, the ransom of my bold attempt shall be this cold corpse on the earth's cold face. But if I thrive, the gain of my attempt, the least of you shall share his part thereof. Sound drums and trumpets boldly and cheerfully. God and St. George, Richmond and victory! Exeunt. Re-enter King Richard, Radcliffe, attendants, and forces. What said Northumberland as touching Richmond? That he was never trained up in arms. He said the truth, and what said Surrey then? He smiled and said, the better for our purpose. He was in the right, and so indeed it is. Clock strikes. Tell the clock there. Give me a calendar. Who saw the sun today? Not I, my lord. Then he disdains to shine. For by the book he should have braved the east an hour ago. A black day will it be to somebody. Ratcliffe! My lord. The sun will not be seen today. The sky doth frown and lower upon our army. I would these dewy tears were from the ground. Not shine today? Why, what is that to me more than to Richmond? For the selfsame heaven that frowns on me looks sadly upon him. Enter Norfolk. Arm, arm, my lord, the foe vaunts in the field. Come, bustle, bustle, caparison my horse. Call up Lord Stanley, bid him bring his power. I will lead forth my soldiers to the plain, and thus my battle shall be ordered. My forward shall be drawn out all in length, consisting equally of horse and foot. Our archers shall be placed in the midst. John, Duke of Norfolk, Thomas, Earl of Surrey, shall have the leading of this foot and horse. They thus directed, we shall follow in the main battle, whose puissance on either side shall be well winged with our chiefest horse. This... And St. George de Boot, what thinkst thou, Norfolk? A good direction, warlike sovereign. This found I on my tent this morning. Giving a scroll. Reads. Jockey of Norfolk, be not too bold, for Dickon thy master is bought and sold? A thing devised by the enemy! Go, gentlemen, every man unto his charge. Let not our babbling dreams affright our souls. Conscience is but a word that cowards use, devised at first to keep the strong in awe. Our strong arms be our conscience, swords our law. March on, join bravely, let us to it pell-mell, if not to heaven, then hand in hand to hell. What shall I say more than I have inferred? 
Remember whom you are to cope with all, a sort of vagabonds, rascals, and runaways, a scum of Bretons and base lackey peasants, whom their o'ercloyed country vomits forth to desperate adventures and assured destruction. You sleeping safe, they bring you to unrest. You having lands and blessed with beauteous wives, they would restrain the one, disdain the other. And who doth lead them? But a paltry fellow, long kept in Brittany at our mother's cost. A milksop, one that never in his life felt so much cold as over shoes in snow. Let's whip these stragglers o'er the seas again. Lash hence these overweening rags of France, these famished beggars weary of their lives, who, but for dreaming on this fond exploit for want of means, poor rats had hanged themselves. If we be conquered, let men conquer us, and not these bastard Bretons, whom our fathers have in their own land beaten, bobbed, and thumped, and on record left them the heirs of shame. Shall these enjoy our lands? lie with our wives, ravish our daughters. Hark! I hear their drum. Drum afar off. Fight, gentlemen of England! Fight, bold yeomen! Draw, archers! Draw your arrows to the head! Spur your proud horses hard and ride in blood! Amaze the welkin with your broken staves! Enter a messenger. What says Lord Stanley? Will he bring his power? My lord, he doth deny to come. Off with his son George's head! My lord, the enemy is past the marsh. After the battle, let George Stanley die. A thousand hearts are great within my bosom. Advance our standards, set upon our foes. Our ancient word of courage, fair Saint George, inspire us with the spleen of fiery dragons. Upon them, victory sits on our helms! Exeunt. Scene 4. Another part of the field. Alarum. Excursions. Enter Norfolk and forces. To him, Catesby. Rescue, my lord of Norfolk! Rescue! Rescue! The king enacts more wonders than a man, daring and opposite to every danger. His horse is slain, and all on foot he fights, seeking for Richmond in the throat of death. Rescue, fair lord, or else the day is lost. Alarum. Enter King Richard. A horse! A horse! My kingdom for a horse! Withdraw, my lord. I'll help you to a horse. Slave, I have set my life upon a cast, and I will stand the hazard of the die. I think there be six Richmonds in the field. Five have I slain today instead of him. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Exeunt. Scene 5. Another part of the field. Alarums. Enter from opposite sides King Richard and Richmond, and Exeunt fighting. Retreat and flourish. Then re-enter Richmond, with Stanley bearing the crown, and divers other lords and forces. God and your arms be praised, victorious friends. The day is ours. The bloody dog is dead. Courageous Richmond, well hast thou acquit thee. Lo, here! This long unserped royalty from the dead temples of this bloody wretch have I plucked off to grace thy brows withal. Wear it, enjoy it, and make much of it. Great God of heaven, say amen to all. But tell me, is young George Stanley living? He is, my lord, and safe in Leicester town. Whither, if it please you, we may now withdraw us. What men of name are slain on either side? John, Duke of Norfolk, Walter, Lord Ferrers, Sir Richard Breckenbury, and Sir William Brandon. Inter their bodies as becomes their births. Proclaim a pardon to the soldiers fled that in submission will return to us. And then, as we have taken the sacrament, we will unite the white rose and the red. Smile heaven upon this fair conjunction that long have frowned upon their enmity. What traitor hears me and says not amen? England hath long been mad and scarred herself. The brother blindly shed the brother's blood. The father rashly slaughtered his own son. The son, compelled, been butcher to the sire. All this divided York and Lancaster, divided in their dire division. Oh, now let Richmond and Elizabeth, the true succeeders of each royal house, by God's fair ordinance conjoin together. And let their heirs, God, if thy will be so, Enrich the time to come with smooth-faced peace, 
with smiling plenty and fair prosperous days. Abate the edge of traitors, gracious lord, that would reduce these bloody days again, and make poor England weep in streams of blood. Let them not live to taste this land's increase, that would with treason wound this fair land's peace. Now civil wounds are stopped, peace lives again, that she may long live here, God say, Amen. Exeunt. End of Act 5 End of Richard III by William Shakespeare